Happy Halloween, everybody. I'm Terry Harden, and I was a judge in Outrageous Pumpkins, and I'm going to teach a virtual pumpkin sculpting class. This is Terry Harden. She's a, well, she's an Imagineer. She's a speaker, and she's an international artist. This, I always suggest a face, because a face, you know what it is. So here's a mini ribbon tool, and you can kind of see that they're, they're very tiny. This is what I draw with. I simply take this sideways and you see how it's getting that little shaving yeah. then I take this tool I call it a depth tool I'm gonna go in and just take about a quarter eighth inch shavings off like this then and what you do is you do it on the side that you want to pop out so I want this lip right here to come forward so that's why I've kept carving in there do you draw the whole thing first and then start getting into getting the depth some do some want to do that but it doesn't really matter I say usually locate the mouth so then you can kind of work your way up but artists are different okay. then serving as an inspiration she reached for the stars and actually caught one in her career as an artist and puppeteer with 30 years experience we all have seen her amazing skills showcase and block Blockbuster films and television hits, as well as theme park attractions across the world. Welcome, Terry Harden. Thank you for having <laughs> me. Now, Terry, familiarize us with some of your most popular work. The most popular work, I think the number one thing here in Florida, for example, is the Splash Mountain ride vehicle, which has the rabbit on the front and which has the wood texture on the sides. The rabbit actually is my creation, and you can find it both here and in Tokyo. It was probably my second time I was Imagineer, and then I, w I left, and then I came back, and it was my first project after that, and it was probably one of the most most uh, fun and whimsical ones that I got to do. But you've certainly been involved in a number of other popular things in pop culture, such as mm -hmm. films and TV hits. What yes, I, I started, I've done probably uh, quite frankly about 42 films and television among those Ghostbusters which continues to be the gift that keeps on giving <laughs> people just seem to refine it and re fall in love with it the first one along that men in black both films Flintstones all the films these are the hitchhiking ghosts let me point out something about them first of all they are individual not sold individual I'm only gonna sell them in a set but what you wanted you haunted mansion collectors out there is you wanted them to be separate you wanted to be able to tuck them into your levels of your of your shelves amongst your collection as though they were the happy-go-lucky silly haunted mansion hitchhiking ghosts that you all know and love Hello and welcome to Landon Live. My name is Landon Harvey and happy Halloween. This is very exciting. Uh, tonight we have on Terry Harden, who you might recognize from Food Network's Outrageous Pumpkins. 
and she's an all around artist. Terry, how are you doing tonight? And can you go ahead and share all of your titles that you've had in your career? Oh my goodness, if I do that, you guys will have your bunny slippers on. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I had a fan that did a chronology of my life. And after 20 pages, I said, oh, my goodness, you look through it. You don't believe I don't believe I did it. So it's kind yeah. of surprising that that's that's what's happened. But I just I think a lot like you, Len, and I ran through and said to myself, I want to do this. So let's just light this candle and go for it. Uh -huh. You know, so yeah. so started out uh, making a lamb chop puppet. I was bullied as a kid. I can't imagine why I look like everybody else. But uh I was bullied as a child. I'm half black, half white. I was born um, in 1957. So those of you doing the math, I'm 63. Um, <laughs> but the thing was, is that as a little kid, I was very light skinned, but I had hair that was African-American or black, as I like to say, because there are many people out there that uh, don't like right. titles. And so let's just say uh, my dad's black, my mom's white. And so there's where the bullying came in. And I decided I to build a little character that I could talk to and be with. And I saw Sherry, I saw Sherry Lewis and uh, duplicated her lamb chop. And that became my, my little confidant. And since then puppeteering has been a big thing for me. I, at first I thought, no, but I wanted to be an actress and people didn't like the way I looked. Okay. So you go in and yeah. you audition as an actor and they take one look at you and they say, yes or no. A lot of times before you even open your mouth, and in my case, they didn't like the way I looked. They could tell that I had uh, very much, um, you know, my hair stuck out in all directions. It wasn't always dreadlocks. And uh, and I looked like a white kid with this blonde Afro and they were like, uh, no. So uh, they went for my sister who uh, has long dark hair and has cocoa skin. And they went with that because that was more of an inbox for commercial and television at the time. And uh, so I was concerned. I, I In school, I could do all these plays, no problem, no problem. But then I was introduced to puppets and puppets allowed me to do my art, build my characters and not worry about how I looked. So that's how puppets kind of came into being. So Ghostbusters, Men in Black, uh, Jungle to Jungle, Indian in the Cupboard, uh, Flintstones 1 and 2, Men in Black 1 and 2, um, I've done commercials like the Foster Farms Chickens, uh, Philadelphia Cream Cheese, have worked with Tony Urbano on uh, Chicken McNuggets and a couple of McDonald's commercials. I'm an actor, so I was in Shark as a jury foreman. So it just, it just, and then I'm an Imagineer who designed attractions all over the world. So it just, just, you know, you're piling it on and you go, wow, I can't even believe it. So what was, <laughs> what was your first project that you had that that you undertook that was like, wow, this is my career is going somewhere. Like, I feel I'm successful. Yeah. It right, was called right, BB right. Beagle. It was called BB Beagle. So BB Beagle was a Hanna Barbera production. I was something like 18 or 19. And what had happened is Jim Henson over in London had just announced they were no longer going to do the Muppet show. So everybody and their brother in Hollywood decided, well, let's jump on this bandwagon and try and do some sort of a Muppet showy thing. And BB Beagle with Hanna-Barbera was that. In fact, I remember very vaguely BB Beagle's theme song, but it was just like they had taken every line in the Muppets and made it, tweaked it, and then made it about the BB Beagle show, which was about a beagle and his oh, crazy wow. characters. Oh. And, uh, it, it was a we had uh, Joyce DeWitt as our guest from Three's Company, which if you're younger than that, you may not know what that is, but Google it. And then <laughs> right. I'm sure we have some listeners that are like, oh yeah, I know who that is. It, yeah, it just goes yeah. Right, right across my head. <laughs> yeah. They but they put me on a plane for my first time, flew me up to Canada for my first time. I was happy to have a star at my door for the first time. I'm 19. I had to use what's called a television monitor and had no idea because all of my puppets I had done like right here. So so with them being right here or right here, not up in the air and looking at a monitor down there, I had never done that before. So I had to practice it. And if if people out there have done puppets before, the monitor is a small television screen that shows you what's on camera. It's a wonderful device. But back in those days, they did not flip, meaning you now can activate your camera so that 
much like a selfie, it mirrors your movements. When you raise your right hand, it looks like your left hand because it's like you're looking in a mirror. And uh, right. one of the things that I didn't realize I was doing is I was doing a show called Lost on Earth where half of the puppeteers didn't like their monitors flipped and the other half liked their monitors flipped. And I could jump oh, wow. between both camps without even without even knowing it. So I'm ambidextrous, but I was going through and people were like, how are you doing that? And you were, what? And then I went, oh, man, yeah, that is a little weird. But it was because of my early training without a flipped monitor that I was able to just kind of take to do it. But I didn't realize it until someone brought, you know, pointed out. So my first show was BB Beagle. And I felt mm -hmm. like a rock star because I had been working at a photomat store, which is a little kiosk where people used to bring their film to be developed. Film is the stuff that used to go in cameras. It was never digital. It wasn't digital. Little things dropped in. No. Anyway. Right, right. <laughs> and I was making, I think I was making like five bucks an hour, six bucks an hour, thought I'd died and gone to heaven, right? And then I was hired for BB Beagle and I was making 1100 a week. So it was huge for such a young girl to get, you know, that felt very successful. So did you, know, you have a portfolio sudden, or how did, I mean, did they just put out, you know, this, a need for how, how were you, how did you go from, you know, working at that kiosk to... It's a good question. So there was a call for puppeteers and it was with Sid and Marty Croft Productions. They wanted puppeteers. And what would happen is that they would put you through little tests. It was kind of like a escape room, except for you didn't have to escape. It was just a different thing you had to do. So the oh, first wow. thing you had to do, the first thing you had to do was a marionette. And if you could make the marionette walk, you would proceed to the next or it could do something. And I had loved marionettes since I was a kid. So I had built several and then they take you to hand puppets and they would watch you do your sinking and stuff. And Tony Urbano headed that up. That's how we first met Tony Urbano known for cruise ships and also the little snuggles bear. And he did McDonald's. He did all kinds of stuff. And they picked 30 people to be in this training. And I must have that point must've been about, Oh, 16. And there were three women and the rest were all men. So that was one of the benefits for me is because back in those days, now there's more women who are puppeteers, but back then there weren't many women who were puppeteers. And, and uh, so they, they were really excited. Did you worry about was, that going in or were you, did you take it as a challenge? What was that I like? I actually didn't know because they would bring us in individually. So those of you uh -huh. who love and know Jim Henson, and those of you who are from New York, you know that the new, well, and I'll explain it to you. On the East Coast, they do group auditions. On the West Coast, we don't like that. Okay. We're like a voiceover person. We want to come in individually and we want to do our shtick individually because we don't want others to take what we, we've developed. Okay. Right. I would imagine with the ventriloquist, it's similar with uh, any performer. They have these things that they do that are absolutely yours but right your bits jim or your, felt, yeah, your thing you cling to. Mm -hmm. and jim felt like an ensemble was better so when jim came to the west coast we didn't take too kindly to him putting us in the same room at seven at a time so uh some people got really angry about it and i yeah. was just like well you know it is what it is but i would go in and audition myself so for this i went through the room doing each one of these things by our by myself and if i advanced i stayed on the top level and if i didn't if they thought okay this person's not going to work you went downstairs and you were kicked out onto the street so it was, was just it like, like i said <laughs> so it was like whoop, gone and eh, you're not it you know <laughs> where am i you know? crazy. <laughs> did you did you have like a specific amount of time you had to like accomplish these goals or like for each room? No, or they seem to be, they just wanted to see if you could do it. Also, they wanted to see okay. if you had a, 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 a good personality, I think is probably uh -huh. part of it. Of course, back sure. then, I think they just wanted to make sure you had good lip sync and that you had good, uh, uh, you knew where the puppet could be, you know, on camera, you know, you mm -hmm. were looking at a monitor. So you didn't want the puppet to lean like this. They'd be like, the person's do the entire show and their arm is not going straight, you know? <laughs> Right, right. The whole performance is like this. You know, they're like, 
wait, all the wait, minor wait, details that add to the characterization and the realism of the puppet. Yeah, they will, you know, and then they want to know how long you can do this straight up and over your head because you're you've got that over your head for quite a long time, and uh, so so that's that's sort of the the things that we went through. And then when we were in this training course, we worked with June Foray for voices. I mean, you don't get any better than June Foray. And um, I worked with uh, Harvey Limbeck, who was a comedy director back then. So we'd worked mm -hmm. with the top people, Tony Urbano as puppeteer, and so on and so forth. And uh, and then they, they, at the end, said, okay, we're going to keep you guys in mind. And they would bring us on for various shows. And uh, my first show was Earl Roberts Celebration. <laughs> Man, ay ay ay. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah, yeah. So you felt like you were doing it anytime someone called you to do a puppet show. You felt you know that they, they said, okay, we're gonna pay you to do puppets or ventriloquism. Like with you, ventriloquism. You go, okay, right. I, a score. That's great. Sure. So had you already been familiar and done you know carvings and different type of sculpting? I mean, had you done that from when you were you know in school till? this point or did you pick that up later in your career like where you did you already have these it happened skills later it happened okay. later i um i was drawing and painting mostly and then in high school i discovered actual sculpting in clay but i soon realized that sculpting in clay was going to be expensive for me in my little budget so i started mm -hmm. tearing up seat cushions and chair cushions and started to carve with scissors you know, sure. those Fisker scissors. I started to carve mm -hmm. with that and make my characters out of foam, thinking that this would hold me over until I got hired and I found out how they really did it. And then when mm -hmm. I got there, everybody wanted to know how mine were made because they were lighter and not so heavy and easier, you know, to do. So people, I would, was, well, I want to know how you guys are doing it, you know? Yeah. So, it was a bunch of collaborative artists. I remember when I was 16, I was building puppets for my, um, um, like an elective we had in school and I was taking another class and I was building these characters. And I, this lady leaned over and her name was Jeannie and she had a puppet theater that the, the who's who of Hollywood would bring their kids. And so she saw my characters and she said, do you want a job? And I was like, what do you do? And she says, I'm Jeannie of Genie Land. Okay. And she said, uh, you're going to love it there. And I, I really did. It was a place where kids would have a birthday party. And in the front area, that was your cut your teeth time. You did games while the kids all gathered and waited to go into the theater. And then you could work in the food and beverage area, cake mm -hmm. and punch and stuff. And then you could also work up in the in the loft doing stage lighting. So I told her if I came, I just wouldn't do food and beverage, but I would do the other things. Oh. And she was like, right, right. She she said, really? And I said, it's not to be difficult. It's just that I'm I'm not into food and beverage. I don't want to clean up junk. Mm -hmm. And so she was kind of like, right. hmm. And I, she said, well, would you design a show for me? I said, yes. So she said, okay, if you design a show for me, then you can skip that. And her daughter was really angry because she said, you're supposed to go from front of the house to the food, to the stage lighting, to the stage. And Jeannie didn't want that. She wanted my show, which I was already building. And uh, she felt like I should be able to dictate where I want to go and what I want to do. So that's where I started to learn all this kind of different puppetry. I had marionettes I was building, hand puppets mm. I was building. And most of them were foam, you know, or I would rip apart a stuffed yeah, animal that. and make that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, convert it into a puppet. Yeah. You know. I've done some of those. Yeah. So did you did you make this uh, this show? a custom for their venue or was it your show and you were just finding ways to tie it into their theme or their location? I had made a Pegasus. I wanted to make a white Pegasus that flew marionette. So I had made this white Pegasus. And when you mm -hmm. turn the lights out, she glowed. You did black light. She glowed this really pretty white. So oh, Jeannie fell in love with her yeah. and said, Oh my gosh, I have to have this in a show. Can you write a show of fantasy around it? So it started as a shadow puppet show and my shadow puppets aren't dark on light. 
they're actually done with um, construction paper and then you seal it between the shelf liner that's clear. And then I segmented them so that they were colorful. So everything was really colorful. They just weren't black, they were colorful. So it started sure. with that. Sure. And it started with Greek gods or some sort of deity on high of some mountain saying, you know, um, it's time to go to Earth. Let's send Pegasus down, you know, that sort of thing. And then Pegasus mm -hmm. would fly around. And then I had built a fairy and they, did, they had interacted with the child and whatever. And Jeannie just loved it. She she thought, oh, my gosh, this, we've got to do more shows. So she said, I could write. I'll write the shows and you build the puppets. I said, okay. So I did that till I was about 18 or so. And when I was 18, she took me to meet um, Waylon Flowers of Waylon Flowers and Madam. And Waylon Flowers. Oh, neat. yeah. Oh, oh, my goodness. I would look at, oh, I would look at Waylon and I, when we watched him because when you see Waylon Flowers and Madam live, I don't know. I was too young. He was in Vegas. I was too young to get into Vegas mm -hmm. at the time. So, but right. she was right next to him. She was like right here. And so I was really impressed with how alive she was and the fact that he was not a ventriloquist. Mm -hmm. And I was like, afterwards, my question was, wow, your, you, you, your mouth was moving. And he was like, yeah. And I said, you're not a ventriloquist. He said, no. And I said, why not? And he said, because I don't want to put the time in. I don't want to be a ventriloquist. I'll just be a really killer puppeteer. And I thought, oh, I love that. He said, he said, you could be a killer puppeteer. You don't have to be a ventriloquist unless you want to. So I said, well, yeah. I really don't want to. And he goes, he goes, I'm going to go back up there and I'm going to do a performance and you watch me. Don't watch Madam. You watch me. And you couldn't do it. You just couldn't do yeah. it. She was too, yeah. she was too dynamic and he was too, he was dull. And so that's kind of the way I do with my characters now is I, loan them my voice and I, I don't worry about my mouth moving. I just create the character because the character is dynamic enough. You're watching. And now with masks, who cares? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And even before masks, a lot of ventriloquists just had a, 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 a goofy looking puppet and they, you know, they couldn't do it like Waylon did, but uh, <laughs> they would pass as a ventriloquist and stick that in their title. But uh, no, it was really interesting. And I think he used to open with a joke about how he was, you know, Madam would say, you know, I'm, uh, Wayland's no ventriloquist and I'm no dummy or something like that. And then they go into their bed and, and just breaking the ice with that for the new people that are, that are watching Wayland, you know, kind of, uh, you know, breaks the fourth wall and, and just kind of gets that, um, you know, uh, commotion kind of settled. So it's, it was just so interesting. And I, you know, going back and seeing clips of him and, uh, and Adam on YouTube, I mean, you look at the puppet and you're like, you know, that's so basic, you know, compared to the puppets we have today, where you can put mechanisms in them and so many different things. And the way that he manipulated the arms and the just the, every every little um, aspect of, of Madam in performance is truly inspirational. So it's mm -hmm. uh, really So you're young really kidding, great. You're, watching, you're, young kidding, you're watching someone like that, someone like landing, that. doing that. Yeah. You're like, oh my gosh, wow, that is phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love. It. I use um, I use uh, uh, rods on my on a few of my characters in my show that were inspired by Waylon and uh, a fellow ventriloquist uh, Dan Horn. So, um, you were actually on a you were a judge on Food Network's Outrageous Pumpkins. Uh, how long have you been <laughs> pumpkin carving? And when uh, you got into it, was it just another medium you wanted to conquer, or was it something? What was your what was your stance when you got into that? Well, I love, I love sculpting, which is kind of funny because I fell into it. I was drawing. My mother is a watercolor artist and I was drawing and drawing and drawing, but I always had to have a model. When I sculpt, I don't really need, I can sculpt from my, from my head, which is one of the things I thought was pretty cool. Now, when I want it to be really super detailed, I'm getting ready to work on something now that I really want to be exquisite. So I'm pulling out all kinds of content to, to make that I want, that I want to see and I want to do. It's all this different kind of, it's a fantasy piece. So I want to grab oh, cool. from, I'm grabbing from all elements to do it, mm -hmm. not to copy, but to create this creature that I have in my head. Sure. So I love sculpting. I was reading the newspaper, uh, the va the daily, I don't really remember what it was, but, but I was looking at the newspaper and on the cover, was a man who had carved some faces by removing the skin of the pumpkin and carving the flesh of it. 
Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, hey, that's kind of a good idea. I've often thought a jack-o'-lantern is a little wasteful. You have a really yeah. beautiful thick wall, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. The wall's like this thick when you carve a triangle out of it. It's like, boy, that's a waste. So, yeah, two, three so triangles and come on a like, day. It's like, come on. Yeah, like a kid, I was like, hmm. But the guy said he used push tools. He said he used these wood carving. You could buy them for $5. And they were mm. like set of 10 push tools. And uh-huh. it was um, November 1st. I went down to my market and I asked them if I could have some pumpkins. And they go, oh, they're free. Take as many as you want. So I took about oh, wow. six. And yeah. this is a keynote. If you're someone who wants to practice cu- pumpkin sculpting, go on November 1st. People mm. don't want their pumpkins anymore. So a lot of times you can get them for free. And sometimes they're like, we have a farm out here that it's on, um, it, they're going to do a half price sale. So, you know, that's better than nothing, but I, you can go around places. They just want them gone. So they're going to, they'll charge you five bucks, one buck for something that was 40, $50 or even more. Right. So I found these pumpkins. I bought this tool set and I did two swipes on it and cut myself. And I said, this sucks. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> There's got to be a better way. So I pulled out my sculpting tools, my mini ribbon sculpting tools, pull tools, and I started carving the pumpkin. And I started doing it with these pull tools. So I said, oh my gosh, this is so much easier. And oh my goodness, you know. And then yeah. I started to realize that certain, not all pumpkins are created equally. Some have very, very thin walls. Some have very, very thick walls. And there's a variety, unfortunately, that happens in a... Um, market that can sometimes have a thread in it like celery if you catch that the thing rips in half so the one thing i really don't want to have a beginner do is to get that kind of a pumpkin because it's going to be devastating to them if the thing all of a sudden falls apart that you know how it is when you're beginning something you always sure. blame yourself and i is didn't that want like people getting, to do that. is that like getting one from like a uh, walmart versus getting one from like a farmer's market like is it the, mm-hmm. the care that's put into it or is it just uh, random it's part of the care that's went into it. And then there's all these different varieties of pumpkins. Who knew? Okay. Right. I knew there were little pumpkins called pie pumpkins and bigger pumpkins mm-hmm. called jack-o'-lanterns. I had no idea there were white pumpkins called the polar bear or the ghost that mm-hmm. underneath, if you get a white pumpkin and you scrape the flesh off it, you might get white flesh like in a cassava or you might get peach flesh. And the peach flesh oh, wow. is just, is so pretty and then you yeah. light these from behind. They're just, they're just, they're just amazing. They're amazing. And so I started to sculpt this flesh and put a light behind it. And I realized that this was something that is so much fun that I just couldn't stop. I thought, you know, and at the time, I think you think to yourself, you're the only person that's doing this. Well, I knew the guy from the paper had been doing it, but I didn't know if he knew, you know that the scraping mm-hmm. tools were good. So I'll show you right. if it will be kind to me. I'll just show you my lady. Oh, okay. I have, I you know, it's so funny when I do these because sometimes I, we, I was just speaking with you earlier and saying, man, you're really good at what you do. And <laughs> uh, it's good to touch with the young because they know what they're doing, whereas me. <laughs> but anyway, here's my lady. So she oh, was wow. sculpted with a scrape tool and she's very pretty. She's about the size of a regular jack-o'-lantern, about six inches tall, five inches mm-hmm. across. But what really makes them spectacular is when they're lit. So when they're lit, they just take on a whole new, beautiful lantern look to them. And it's just a spectacular way to illustrate your sculpting. So I just was like, ah! you know, <laughs> So, and so the bigger Terry, the pumpkin, you, the better. Do you have it lit while in certain processes while you're sculpting, or do you light you it at the very end? Of the display? Okay. You can. I like the surprise, but yeah. you can put a light in there and sculpt to the light. Many of my students will do that. I'll say sculpt to the light, not mm-hmm. go to it, but sculpt to it. So that way they understand hot versus cold. Because if we look at this young lady again, the thicker mm-hmm. areas are going to be your darker areas and the super hot areas are like our tear ducts and the yellows. All the yellows are the hot. That's punched through or nearly through. And then so now you're beginning to play with what do you like dark? What do you like light? 
You like the roses, the peaches, the different colors. You start to really play in it like that. And it's, oh, it's just wonderful. Did it take you a while to get the symmetry down for that? Because pumpkin is a very interesting media. Or were you just, just kind of, the more pumpkins you, you carve? I think I took it, I looked at it and said, does it really need to be symmetrical? You know, you ask yourself, does it really need to be symmetrical or can it be weird? Because when you teach people, you don't want them to get in the magma of their mind of it's got to be symmetrical. Nature right, is it has not to be perfect. perfect right. Way. You don't want to make it perfect. Like for one thing, I tell people that you love teeth. Like I love to sculpt teeth. So this is my cheeky and he's all teeth. He's three feet across yeah. and nothing but teeth. Okay. So you say, so if you love teeth, then you can say to yourself, this one's fun because it's nothing but teeth. Or everyone loves my weird pumpkin because who says it has to be a face? So there's my weird pumpkin. You know, this was to tell people to go to my front door because for some reason they kept skipping my front door. So the arm is made out of a squash and the pumpkin is just the little pumpkin that I caught. I opened up and stuck that in a hole and then it points. So the point is, is that now that you have this dimensional ability, it frees you to do whatever you want on a pumpkin. It doesn't have to be. So I'll show you a perfect example of it doesn't have to be symmetrical would be my dragon's egg. So this looked like a dragon's egg, but you see, it's not symmetrical. I just made wow. this little dragon in a fetal position and then I lit him. And it's just people go, whoa. And and yeah. you will yeah. even, if you take a class and mm -hmm. you do this, you may look at your pumpkin and go, oh, it's really awful. And then you'll light it and you go, because oh. the surprise factor is amazing how much light just changes the whole mood of it. So that's how I got involved in it. And I was all about lighting them. Then I meet and judge Ray Villafane, who's the pumpkin king. Mm -hmm. You've seen probably seen a lot of Ray Villa yes. pumpkins. They're yes. just stunning. But he doesn't really like his. He likes his to be lit on the outside. And he really works with the detail on the outside, which is fabulous. But wow. and I would look at his stuff and I'd go, wow, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, and just watch that that kind of. And I've done that style, too. I love it. I love it. But that's what makes us complement each other so well is that I tend to like mine lit and you want to be aware of the thickness of the walls. And he's about be aware of the thickness of the walls to create the planes of the face or whatever he's doing. He'll pull things in like pumpkin seeds to make teeth or mm. add, you know, you can add things like other vegetables and stuff. It's mm. just, it's just a really, really fun, fun thing to do. And then you've got people like uh, Mark who has an Instagram page called Mark Maniac where he does, uh, he sketches on them these elaborately beautiful illustrations and it looks like stained glass almost, it's so nice. So it's really great to look at these different artists and say, wow, this is this is a lot different than three triangles, you know? Yeah, yeah I love that. I have a photo here uh, that relates to pumpkin sculpting. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little so bit I about created that? This video. Yeah, I created this video so people could learn how to do it. Because so many, I couldn't reach out at the time. I wasn't, you know, you say to yourself, you can only reach so far. And this was back in a day when we didn't have the internet and social media. Social media has really uh, brought us all together. Thank God before the, the, the pandemic happened after this. Or what would mm -hmm. we do? You know? Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's it's been a been a real treat being able to connect with people especially in this time and that's why i love doing these interviews and especially um you know one of the the few good things to come from the pandemic is the surge of creativity now that everyone's kind of locked up in their homes they're trying new things getting out whether it's you know planting a garden or getting out trying trying different skills and, and getting a new uh, skill set and trying new hobbies um will you tell the muppet story of your audition kind of switching gears here oh boy yes so <laughs> Uh, I got hired by Tony Urbano to go do a chicken McNugget commercial in New York. Now, back in the day, they were little foam critters that you sculpted with scissors. See, I thought I was just doing something to get into the industry. And the next thing you know, the industry is doing what I do. So I was like, how nice. Yeah. <laughs> 
this happen. So you would take scissors and you would carve these little McNuggets about this big. And then it had a little mechanism that their little bodies would squeeze down and they would go like this and dance and you would work uh, them with a rod on or whatever. They'd sit on Ronald McDonald's shoulder or they'd sit on a piano or whatever. And for some reason, we had to go to New York to shoot this. So we're in New York and we finish our day. It's like three puppeteers, Tim Blaney, who's another person you might want to interview. He's brilliant. And Tony Urbano and, uh, and myself and uh, another lady from New York who came and worked with us. But at the end of the day, Tony Urbano said, who wants to go to the opera? And I went, opera? And when I looked around, everyone was gone, except for me and Tony. <laughs> oh, man. And I was like, um, and Tony says, Terry, you'll love it. We're going to go to the Met. We're going to get dressed up. And we're going to listen to do opera. And I thought, opera. And I said, is it in English? And he says, no, no, it's not in English. Uh, it's in Italian. Or it's in, you know, and I'm like, oh, no, you know, I'm just like, uh, you know, what am I, 20 years old, 21 years old? And I'm thinking mm -hmm. opera. Oh, gosh. I just, I don't, oh, no, no, no. And he says, please. So, okay, I'll, I'll well, okay, let's see how much the tickets are. So we mm -hmm. go to the Met and the only seats are box seats, which means four seats in a box, like you saw, if you've ever seen Phantom of the Opera or yes. anyone with glasses of importance, that's where they sit in a box. And mm. it was like $80 a person. And I'm like, Tony, it's $80. You know, I'm like, yeah. you know, if our $80 is going to go for me, if I don't go. And he said, Oh, please. Oh, please. I've always wanted to see Opera at the Met. Oh, please. Oh, please. And I said, okay, what's in it for me? Mm -hmm. And he said, what do you want? And I said, I want to go see Ha, which was Henson's studio in New York. I said, I want to go see Ha. And he goes, well, you're not going to meet Jim. You want to meet Jim? You're not going to meet Jim. And I was like, actually, no, I don't want to meet Jim Henson. It would be nice to meet Jim Henson, but that's not why I want to go. I want to go. And you, Landon, will understand this. Mm -hmm. I could not figure out how they made Miss Piggy. Yes. I could not figure out how they made Bunsen Honeydew. I wanted mm. to know how are they doing Walking. it. It yes. wasn't Muppet fleece. I knew it wasn't oh. fleece. I knew Kermit was fleece, a fabric, but they are not fabric. And I'm going, I want to see what that, what are they made of? Mm. And he goes, okay, deal. We shook on it. I went to the opera. Most of the time I was trying to figure a way not to fall asleep without because there's only four people in a box and they're all watching you mm. and I'm, but I managed and then we went to Ha and uh while we were there we went upstairs and the first person to come around and say hello was Jim Henson <laughs> Jim Henson took one look at me and went <gasps> now it wasn't because I was so strikingly attractive and it wasn't because I was this magnificent puppeteer he had no idea it was because I was a lady puppeteer and he knew right away that Tony was a number one puppeteer on the West coast. And if I was standing next to Tony Urbano, I must be pretty doggone good. So he automatically walked up, reached out his hand and said, I'm Jim Henson. How are you? And I was like, Whoa, you know, Oh my God. And he started to ask me all these questions and Tony got a little upset and said, <laughs> she's me. And I said, no, I'm not. I haven't worked with you in a while. You know, I'm a work for hire. So please don't say that. And so right. Jim was the one who took me down and taught me about Miss Piggy and how she was made and Bunsen Honeydew, how he was made, which many of you may have seen some of the behind the scenes, but it's a foam sculpted character. And then they use a thing called flocking, which is putting glue on the foam and then using um, electromagnetic currents to make little hairs stand on the end and just coat it. They use it in animals for the, detailed part in their yeah. fur and stuff and uh, it was fascinating I was like oh, that's amazing that's amazing so yeah. we toured the studio and then uh, I left and when I left a door opened and somebody an arm came out like like if you watch the Adams family thing uh -huh. an arm came out and put something in my pocket and disappeared and I was like what the and then I went home and I opened it up and it was a note and it said, Jim Henson would like you to um, audition. And uh, 
I looked at that. I'm now in LA. Jim Henson wants you to audition. And mm-hmm. I was like, uh, oh, I, that's nice, but okay, whatever. And I put the note down and then Jim called me and I thought it was someone punking me. So I said, this isn't Jim Henson. And he goes, yes, it is. And he said, I want to know why you haven't called me back. I gave you this note, you know? And I said, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Henson. I wasn't quite sure it was real. And he was like, why want to be real? And so he said, I want you to come back to New York and work on Sesame Street. And I said, no, thank you. Now, that's the thing that's a shocker to a lot of people. They said, Terry said, no, thank you. Yeah, I said, no, thank you. I don't want to go to New York. Please, no. Did he know you as a puppet builder or as a performer? He knew as a performer. He didn't know I was a builder until I told him I wanted to be a builder. I was a builder. I did. I built my own. Because Landon, you know, and anyone who builds, the only way Mm -hmm. for your puppet to work best for you is to build it yourself. Mm-hmm. You can have and someone else build it for you. you. It's a whole different feeling. You know, mm-hmm. out here in, Cal- you know, in California, the problem is that a lot of shops would build it the way they build other props. And they're always way too heavy. One of my favorite stories is Doc Ock of Spider-Man 3, where the arms of that actor were so heavy, many puppeteers were injured to make those arms work. They were physically hurt. So I said, you know, so I'm like, doesn't have to weigh a ton to be performed. But, you know, I wasn't about to do a movie like that where I'm gonna damage my body. So you you have to kind of think it would have been cool to work on Spider-Man, but not if I'm in traction for three weeks or three months. So these are the kind of things as a puppeteer when other people are building and you're not quite sure how they're, you know, you got to just know that that if they confer with you, you're probably pretty safe. But Jim Henson mm-hmm. puppets were all light and fun, all foam, all beautiful, all great. But I didn't want to be in New York because I could not c- come down from New York. New York was too loud, too much noise, not enough quiet for me. So I told him. If he ever came out to California, I wanted to work with him. And he goes, well, what makes you think I'll work with anybody that's not in New York? And I said, Dave Goles, who plays Gonzo, lives Northern California. And I said, "Um, Steve Whitmire, Rizzo Rat, is in Baltimore. And then, um, or Atlanta. And then Kevin Clash was Baltimore. And he goes, oh, you've done your homework. And I said, yes, I have. So he said, okay, and he hung up the phone. And then in 1989, he came out to California and he called me again. And he said, all right, sister, here's the deal. I'm coming to California. I'm going to do Muppet 3D Vision with Disney. And you're going to audition for me. And if you're not good, I'm going to make it hell for you at that audition. Got it? And I was like, no pressure. (laughs) Bring it on, buddy. Yeah, you know, I'm just yeah. kind of, you know, I'm young and 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 I'm like, yeah, you you bring that, you know, whatever. So the day comes to do the audition. And like I told you, many puppeteers in California were really angry because we walked into the Debbie Reynolds dance studio and they said to us, and it, you walk into a room and everybody is practicing. So in one corner, they've got cameras set up and people are in front of camera with their character. And then the mirror some are in front of the mirror and they're doing their characters. And so the lady says, hello, Terry, I've got your name down on the list. Here's a group of puppets from the Henson company. Pick one and then you're welcome to practice in front of the mirror. You're welcome to practice in front of a camera. You can practice all you want. Well, one of the things that Tony Obano taught me and Tony was a really good mentor, but one of the things Tony taught me was it, the people performing in front of the mirrors and in front of the cameras are not your competition, not in puppets. The person who's sitting reading the paper, that's the one you gotta watch out for. So I curled up and read the paper or just found one that fit well. Mm -hmm. Because again, I build, so I know what I want in feel. And then I sat down and put the puppet in my lap and said, I'm gonna just, call the gods of improv to me and I'm not, I'm not going to show people what I'm doing. And so we went into audition seven at a time again, seven at a time was really taboo in California. 
they were just oh. like, are you kidding me? S what? But you can either be upset because there's seven or you can calm yourself down and say, there's seven people in the room. In order for me to move forward, I can either be intimidated or intimidating. I chose intimidating. I right. I'm going to be intimidating. Now to make life even better, there was a woman there who absolutely hated my guts. And every time she was in an odd, because she believed every time we competed, I got the job. So she just hated me. <laughs> and there she was, okay? You know, you've got that rival in high school. Right, right. Unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't change. Even when you're an adult, there's always someone out there that's kind of like. So here we are, seven in a room. They have us all stand up. And the person in front of us is Brian Henson. So not Jim. And Brian says, well, you know, my father was supposed to be here, but I'm going to get us started because we can't, you know, we can't delay anymore. So right. we're going to have you all stand up. We're going to have you put your arm, your puppets over your heads and you're going to count. Now, if you've ever done lip sync, you understand that counting, there's a, there's a multitude of ways to count. Mm -hmm. But the thing that's going to get you to go down the chute is if you go seven instead of seven. So they're watching for seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven is the one that's either going to have you be kept or out. Mm -hmm. The other ones are 101. They don't want you to enunciate everything 101 because you're flapping in the breeze. 101 is what they want. 101. 101. You see? So so these were things that they line. knew. Hmm? I said that's a fine line between. It is a fine line. Yeah. But if you know your stuff, it's things mm -hmm. that they knew that we should probably know. We were going to be pros. He was looking for pros. So you just go in and I had worked with Tony and several other people and that course and just knew, just knew and felt very comfortable with what I was doing and didn't worry about it at all. Just went mm -hmm. right into it. So they had us count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Well, Tony Urbano also says you only have 30 seconds to take, to make it or break it. So as Brian had us all together count one, one. I did. Everyone went one. And I went one. <laughs> and everyone went two. And I went two. And everyone <laughs> went three. And I went three. And Brian said, stop. And he walked right up to me and he looked me right in the face and he said, let's all count together. Shall we? And I was Yes, sir. But I yeah. knew now, who is he going to be watching out of all those seven? Because the question in Brian's head is, mm -hmm. did she make a mistake or is she punking me? And I was punking him. Did you, did you come up with that on the spot or was that something that you were planning when you were, when you were in the corner with your paper? Okay. You, Tony, said, spot, Tony says, Tony, Tony Urbano. And I think this was Tony and my mentor, Pat Brimer, who has passed, just passed. Uh, both of them said, you know, the, you, you open yourself to these little gifts. Don't close the door. Just go for it. And I thought 30 seconds, I need 30 seconds of Brian's undivided attention. And there's seven people. How do I make me without being, that nah, probably was annoying, actually. But, <laughs> but <laughs> so we, he, he said together, so we all counted together. So there I was counting with my puppet. One, two, three, four, with everybody else. Five, mm -hmm. six. But when we got to seven, I looked at Brian and went like this. Seven, eight, <laughs> nine, ten. <laughs> I love that. Oh, my gosh. That is what you call sealing the deal. Yeah. Because he just yeah. didn't know. He he really, he really didn't know what to think about me. But I had loved the Muppets and I knew the Muppets were were people that were pranksters and playful. So I just decided to play playful. And uh and so Ryan sat us all down and then he said, Terry, because now he he knew what I was doing. So he says, All right, you know, now this became the audition of a little bit of a battle. All right, you're going first, you know. <laughs> So okay, I jumped up and uh, 
he told me that I had to do 60 seconds of ad lib with my character. So I love Star Wars. I've seen it a bazillion times, 181 times. I'm in a skywalking book for my viewings of it. And that's when there was no uh, VHS, no DVDs, no internet. It was all at the <clears throat> movie theater. <laughs> but anyway, so I talked about Star Wars because I was all about Star Wars. So my character just riffed and riffed and riffed about Star Wars. And then I sat down. They said, very good. I sat down and in walked Jim Henson. So my friend who doesn't like me, she, she went like that. She was so happy that, I, right. that everyone else was going to go up in front of Jim and I didn't get to go up in Jim because I was done. Mm -hmm. So I was like, ah, rat, you know, but I sat down very quietly. So after the seven people were done, Brian said, thank you very much. We'll be in touch. If you got the job, we'll call you. If you didn't, of course, we won't call you. And Jim went, oh, no. <laughs> Terry, you don't think you're getting off that easy, do you? And I was like, huh? And he said, get up. <laughs> and I went, yeah. okay. You get over here. Front and center. Okay. Now, 60 seconds of riff, other than what you did for my son. And go. And I just went. I don't even remember what I did, but I just snapped right into it and did it again. And everybody else was jealous because now I'm on tape twice. Right. Right. So, <laughs> needless to say, I did get the job. But, I mean, mm -hmm. it's just, it's crazy. And Jim and I were working on a show together that I'm thinking of, of, um, possibly resurrecting because we were, we were in the kind of the, the egg stage, if you will. And uh, oh. someone said the other day, well, gosh, you could, you could develop it into something. And now with the internet, it's so simple to do that. you Yeah. Can. There's so many resources. Yeah. Out there. So we have this photo. Have this photo. I, believe I believe it's from, is this from Muppets, from tonight? From Muppets tonight? Yes. This is the okay. latest Muppet show. And they invited me to go to Disney and perform. And I was so happy because I was background characters. The most fun characters when you're doing puppets are not the leads. Kermit the Frog and Miss Peaky were probably a lot of fun. But who can forget, you know, Bunsen Honeydew or mm -hmm. Rizzo Rat or some of these characters that were just a peppy that's done by Bill Beretta. The, mm -hmm. Some of these people... Another person you should interview, actually. Bill Beretta, yeah. he's amazing. Anyway, um, they those kind of characters are the ones that have the freedom to be silly and goofy. Kermit always has to have a sense of lead from the front, and sure. Miss Piggy has to have a sense. So so leads are kind of restricted. So I was always can't really veer off, right? right. Side characters. Right. Yeah, you want to be that squir that screwy one in the back. Who wants to be Simba when you can be Timon or Pumbaa? <laughs> Well, Bill, Bill Barrett also did uh, Johnny Fiamma, right? And that yes. was on Muppets in that too, yeah. Yeah. Now, was yeah, that was Bill, that a character he just did on there? Was well, just, I'm not sure, but Bill Barretta was was went to college with Brian, and I remember oh. Brian's mother said, "Oh no, you can't hire Bill because he's your friend." But just because a person is your friend, you're not always, you right. know, bringing them on because they're your friend. Sure, you want to bring your friend on, do your shows. But Bill is very talented, and we did dinosaurs together. And there is no better Earl Sinclair. I just can't think of anyone who's a better suit performer than Bill Beretta as as Earl. So he did, so, and he did some amazing things on that as a suit performer. And that's where it all began. And then he just exploded into this, you know, all these other abilities that he had. So I, I, you know, I know Jane said you can't hire your friend. But then Brian fought for that, and I'm glad he did because he knew that Bill was more than just a buddy. He was going to drink beer right. with. Right. He was this talented, multi-talented performer, and here was his opportunity to show it. So, I love that. What aspects from you said you did when you were younger? You did plays, and you had done some productions in school. Is that correct? Is that correct? So, yep. what aspects from that did you take and translate into puppetry? Oh my gosh. I think one of the things I love about puppetry is for one thing, you don't have to worry about getting old. Carol mm. Spinney would agree with that. You yes. can just be this wonderful character for as long as you want. And you are not 
com you are not confined to gender. So mm. what I mean by that is most of the time, because my voice is so low, I will play boys. A lot mm. of times I play young boys. I did a thing for Henson called Bratz and the girls were too high. They were way up here. And I was like, oh man, I don't want to go there. So mm. I was all of the cool guys and I did all the cool guy stuff. And the cool guys were not a lot of dialogue because it's all about the girls, but I played mm. all the guys. And I was really grateful when they, when they cast me as that. Cause I went into the audition and I said, I really don't want to audition. I'm a little, I'm a lot honest. I said to the production, you've got wonderful women out there who can hit these high notes like nobody else. They are far better for the brats than I am. I'm, I'm, I'm a deeper voice. I'm a smokier voice. I'm not going to ruin my voice for something that you've got people out there that can just nail it. And so they said, well, okay, fair enough. Why don't you do your smoky voice and perform the character and that way we'll have the smoky voice. And after that, they said, we're going to hire you for the boys. And I was like, oh, that's fun. <laughs> so how much, when you got hired for that and you were a part of that project, how much of it was uh, scripted and how much did you, were you able to kind of just ad lib and kind of goof around? Or was it solely, like, does it vary from project or is there kind of a thing yeah. that kind of, Okay. Yeah, it does. I think one of the biggest ones where we got to do, I mean, because puppets, if a person is smart in production and they hire puppeteers, they allow the puppeteers to do what's called the scratch track. In animation, most of the time, an animator will design a character. They'll bring a voice person in to do all of the voice dialogue, and then they'll um, animate the character or they'll animate the character. And then the voice person has to put the mouth into the character. But with puppets, if you record the voices first, Disney has this habit of thinking that puppeteers can't do voices. Where they get that, I have no idea. But it's really, you know how yeah. many puppets I've built and you know how many voices? <sighs> okay, whatever. And, uh, and so they would give you, they would want the voice people. So when we did Country Bears, mm -hmm. they wanted to record all the dialogue with all the voices and then have us perform. It's like putting a puppeteer and probably a ventriloquist in handcuffs. It's like, uh -huh. you got to stick to the script. That right. doesn't work. Doesn't work. Because we get what's called the happy accidents. Crazy, goofy stuff that comes from being locked in a trunk or put inside a couch or spending most of your life underneath the floor. Because as a puppeteer, you're not on the floor. You're underneath it. You're not on the couch. You're inside it. In the case of Muppet Movie, they were in the trunk of the car. Or on the floorboards, right? What, what was Country Bears like for the? I mean, were, were you in a full suit or was that? No, I'm puppeteer. That... I'm pup facial puppeteer. So I did oh, Big God. Al. I did all of his facial expressions, and then my friend John John um, John. I want to say Anderson, but I don't think that's right. Oh, I'm sorry, John. It's it goes with the brain. Sixty three. It must be the problem. Anyway, John was uh, was in Gorillas as the in the mist as one of the main main gorillas he was in um men in black he played this crazy alien and it was himself but he john alexander thank you lord for giving me that john alexander was just an amazing amazing uh suit performer and so he was inside big al and i did the facial expressions and this suit for big al for example was so heavy you could you couldn't barely move in it the head was 80 pounds and the body was then heavy too it was unbelievable so we did this little geisha walk with him. He would just do this little shuffle. And then the movie decided that they were going to do this thing where he's here and then he just goes, boop, and he's over here. So that's what they decided to do. But for the longest time, we created this little shuffle where he'd go, I'm coming. And it would take him like an hour to get, you know, a foot or whatever. And we All would right. do that. John and I would do that together. But the reason Country Bears was, was so great is because Brian said, you can't. You can't do a tract and, ma and make the puppeteers, you know, that's like having them draw on the lines and puppeteers mm. are, are, we're twisted. Why else would we be puppeteers if we're not twisted? We're twisted. Right. We're under the floor. We're, we're, we're where the dirt is, you know, <laughs> that's where yeah. we live. Yeah. And so, uh, and then the puppets live above the ground. We're the un people under the stairs. So what happened was Disney agreed to let us film two different visuals one 
where we performed to a voice track and the other one where we did a scratch track and the voices had to come in after. And there's a girl named Julianne Busher. She did Tennessee Bear. And it's the scene in Country Bears where Tennessee is counseling. He's a marriage counselor and he's talking to the couple. And then he starts to cry over Trixie. Well, the voice person had read it. Trixie. <laughs> Trixie. Oh, Trixie. And it was just, you know, because you're a voice guy and you're looking at a still. You know, you can be the best voice guy in the world, but if you don't know how a character is going to act, it's a challenge for you. Okay. So yeah. Julianne and the was too, the, that the character is performed with, you know, changes mm -hmm. the way. Yeah. yeah. So here we got the bear, Tennessee bear. We've got Jody inside and we've got Julianne on the outside articulating the face. So you saw it in the movie. Trixie, Trixie. <laughs> this was all them. <laughs> that scene. And they just, there was no, there was no contest. They did not do it one way because we wanted it another way. This is mm -hmm. the way per puppets work. It is yeah. the ultimate teamwork. It is the greatest joy because it takes a lot of people to make one animal work. Two people to make an animal work, sometimes three people. And it's just so much fun to, to know your job and to pull back so not everything is moving. In yeah. Ghostbusters, I did the temple dog. Yes, we have. The temple dog picture. had this dog, okay? This dog was me. And then some people did toes and some people did eyes, etc. because it was built a little differently. Again, what was that made out of? By, it's, it's, uh, uh, it was, a uh, a skeleton and oh. a fiberglass. Oh. Okay. Oh. Oh. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, also the foam latex over the face. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yes. you've got that over the face. You've got the mechanics eyes inside, just like you had said, Landon. It was had some mechanics in it. Someone sure. was making the sure. teeth part and all of that, and I was making the head growl and do all this kind of stuff. So I'm hanging 40 feet in the air. I'm in a harness, uh -huh. a stunt harness. It's open below me, 40 feet. Anything goes <laughs> wrong, I'm going to be a smudge. And I was up on this thing, making it roar and growl. I could do this and make it roar and growl. And then they did eyes and turn the head and everything and blah, blah. But I'm laying flat. I'm laying like this and going like this to make it happen. But originally, the Ghostbusters team thought they could pay somebody $5, bring them in, give them a control, and make this dog work. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that everyone wanted to see their thing on camera and the dog had convulsions because everything's moving. So this is right. the thing about a puppeteer. If a puppeteer is toes, they know when to move toes. If a puppeteer is head, they know when to move head. And when it all works, it all works. Right. So right. that's why it. It you can't be overdone hire pros. You always hire pros. And that's what Jim learned. Jim said, if they're not Screen Actors Guild, I don't want to deal with them. And he was absolutely correct because he knew that if you made it in the Screen Actors Guild, which is where the puppeteers live, they had they had had to work very, very hard to get there and they had to be hired a certain amount of time. And then when working with him, you know, he knew he just, he just knew you were going to bring it and not make him undo a lot of stuff that he had to do. So that was one of the, the biggest blessings of, of being, you know, and it was the same 14 for us in California. You would have auditions of one to 200 people and it would go down to the same 14. Because we just, you know, we go, hey, old home week. Hey, how you doing? How you doing? Right, How's right. it at? You know. <laughs> what was it like to uh, to be on the set of Ghostbusters? And how, I mean, would they call you in for certain things? Or were you able to, like, hang around the set and, and the other actors and uh, performers? Oh, yeah. Oh, Ghostbusters yeah. was my second film. My first one was Dune. Okay. And Dune I went on as a builder. And then I was Skinny Kid. And so as a skinny kid, Sean Young wanted to, well, they, I think they wanted her to stay in her trailer in Mexico where it was really hot, but I could fit her outfit, except for that her arms were thinner than mine. So they built me a still suit and I stunt doubled for a lot of her running across the hot sand 
While she sat in air-conditioned comfort, I boiled in the suit and ran across sand. All right. It's okay. I didn't mind. But uh, but so uh, then what happens is when you have a group of builders in um, Hollywood, they go, hey, blah, blah's hiring. Blah, blah's hiring. In this case, Ghostbusters is hiring. And Dune was finishing up. So they said, why don't you all, why don't you take this number, call them up and say, hey, I'm just getting off Dune. Do you need somebody to help you on? Ghostbusters. And that's what happened. And we all went down different times to audition. And I had a huge portfolio. Back in the day, it was one you carried in a big thing that was really heavy. And you opened it up and you said, this picture and this picture and this picture and this picture. And um, the, I'm curious. I want, I want to kind of pause here. What would you say the portfolio is today? iPad or a tablet. Oh, okay. Lordy, what a nice little convenient now, it mm. took me a while to embrace it, okay? Now mm. your your iPhone or your smartphone can do the same thing because you can put them into albums and say, okay, here is like I showed you my pumpkins. I simply went there and said, here's this, here's this, here's this, here's I built this, this is how I did this. And it's just so nice to have it in a thing that's not, you know, <laughs> here's the pages, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Right, right. Do you recommend for people that have um, had these different experiences to post them on their social media and on their websites and that type of thing? Or are you yeah. are you more like you should have it on a on a resume that way when you you can present it a certain I, I, way? Well, here's what I if 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 you're if if a person is out there and they want to do something, okay, let's say you want to be an imagineer, or you want to be a puppeteer or whatever. Sure. Back in my day, don't you just love when old people say that? Back in my day, but anyway, back in my day, you had to go knock on the door. Please, sir, may I have a job? And you had to build a resume. I'm not saying you don't have a resume. Always have a resume. Yay, have a resume. But I can tell you, for example, how you did it, do it my way. Or how about we bring in what we have, which is social media and the internet, Instagram, Facebook, and now TikTok, I guess. I haven't gone over to Tik or Talk, but the fact of the matter is that you have all of these venues in which to create and to show your stuff. So sure. I see many artists post their work. So to answer your question, Landing, yes, post your work, but that's not enough. Because you know when you post your work, people do what? They like it. Mm. Like, like. Like, we're like, you know, we follow everybody. Like, 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 right, like, right, like. Right, right. But what kind of, how does that get you anywhere? You may have a thousand million zillion followers and a hundred gazillion likes, but you're still broke or you're still not doing what you want to do. So the hmm. thing you've got to do is to post your dream as well. So if you want to be a puppeteer, you create a show. You say, if Jim Henson was to come to me and say, Landon, what show would you do? Then you sit there and you say, Landon says mm, to himself, what would I do? This is what I say as Terry. If I'm going to do a show of some sort, what does Terry like? So the couple things on my YouTube channel, I started doing stop motion and I did a tea party and I did a ghost dance for Disney because a lot of my followers are missing Disneyland. So I did these. I had never done stop motion before or very little. So I said, let's see. I just got up one day with my husband and made these little videos. And I said, oh, I wanted to do something fun. Now I'm not looking for a job as a stop motion animator, but if you mm. are someone who wants to be a stop motion animator, then you would say, this has always been my dream to be X. I've always wanted to be a puppeteer. Here's what I did. Or mm. I always wanted to build rides for Disneyland. Let me show you one now. Shoom. Because they're watching, especially now they're watching. But they're now, really watching. This is an interesting, right? Now, this is an interesting thing. So, when, uh, you know, if someone like that were to get recognized um, by someone for a spot, do they have to work their way up or are they brought on for certain projects and then they're like, you know, we'll call you if we like your work? How does that, or does it just vary depending on the person? It kind of depends on what you say or what you want to do. So Tony Urbano was the senior vice president, Tony Urbano, Tony, sorry, Tony Baxter, Tony Baxter. I just switched from puppeteers to Disney in the same first, but Tony Baxter was the senior vice president of Imagineering for the longest time 
Back in the day when there was no internet, he built a roller coaster using parts from Mousetrap, I understand. The little ball that rolls along the coaster, except for he designed a Disneyland ride. He hand carried it to Imagineering. He walked up. He was all of, I think, 16 or 17. And he said, I want to be an Imagineer. Look what I built. Now you don't have to walk up. And Lenny can't answer you can't walk up. You just do it. You just build it. And you just show it. What do you want to do? You want to be a concept artist? Create a show, you know, and then you show it. Now, some people are worried about being copied or lifted from you where your stuff is dated. They date what? everything on your Instagram, on your Facebook. It's, it's dated. almost better to put your stuff out there because you can prove that you did it first. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they're looking. So if you were to Google a thing called Scary Mary, and this is older, but it was a guy who was an editor and he really, a young man who was an editor. It's one of my favorite stories. And he wanted to edit for film. Maybe he was editing for his local commercials or whatever, but he wanted to do the big movies. So he took Mary Poppins and he made it a scary movie called Scary Mary. So he didn't edit the whole movie because as you know, copyright infringement, they're going to pull you down. But what he did do was he took, uh, he made a trailer of Mary Poppins. So it's the scene where she's floating into town and the voice said, she came in the night. Stay awake. Don't close your eyes. Scary Mary. And you can Google it. It's still on YouTube. It's amazing. He did three. I can't remember the third one, but the second one was The Shining, like a slapstick comedy. He's funny. He's witty. Here's Johnny. You know, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. It was so he was the first person hired. to approach this style and to and yeah, do and it when you're hired. thinking that. Wow. He just thought this will be cool. And then who was it? The rock group. I'm not much for music, so forgive me if I screw this up. But I think it was Journey, where the lead singer just decided to sing. And all of a sudden, they need the lead singer. And guess who gets it? This kid. Oh, wow. He just sang all the And all of a sudden, now he's, he's he goes from being, you know, in Idaho, wherever mm -hmm. he was, to being the lead right. singer of, of a top. You got to see your dreams, guys. You got to see your dreams. You got to get out there and you got to see your dreams. To sketch is not enough. I work. I worked. Uh, I was on stage with an artist because I'm interviewed on stage quite a bit. I come out and speak to people. You can see I have so much trouble talking. But uh, she did comics, and on Facebook she did comics called Princesses After Dark. So the princesses would now be off duty, and they were all a bunch of girls hanging out and complaining about the men. Well, Disney saw it and they hired her, and now she works for Disney Comics. Now, the downside is she had to get rid of the comic on Facebook, but that was her goal, was to get into Disney. Right. So that's what I'm saying. You show it, you you do it, and you say, what is it you want? Nowadays, yeah. there's no reason why you need to go wait for, please, sir, I have a job. Just say to yourself, this is going to be what it is. They're going to walk up to you. They're going to turn to you and they're going to say, we saw what you did. We want to hire you for something. And then you've got to figure out what that fee is going to be. Okay. So that's where your difference, because they're going to be asking you, you know, what is it going to take for you to come and work for us? See, that's a very interesting thing because, you know, you have the whole, and, and I don't know what it's like for Imagineers, but you have it where, um, you just love to create and like, that's what you want to do. And then the business side comes in, you have to choose your fees. And as a puppet builder, I, I build for myself, but then I build for people all over the world. And that's been one of my biggest difficulties is, is pricing my work. So how do you, how do you approach that when you're brought on for a project? Cause my expectation was, Oh, well, they'll say, this is your budget. We need you to do this. You know, this is what we have to pay you, but it's not like that apparently. So how does that, Sometimes that's that's nice, right? I mean, is you that can counter by saying what's your budget, especially if mm -hmm. they're nice. If there's someone right. who's nice and they say, but 
But Landon, I don't know if you've ever had anybody tell you, I would like to have three three foot figures articulated and sculpted, and I want to pay three hundred dollars each. Mm -hmm. No, three hundred dollars. Well, then go to a college student. You're done. Right. Here. right. Um, <laughs> I've had I've had I've had uh, requests for commissions very similar to that. Exactly. Yeah. Turn we down how to pop it. Hard. Do this. Do that. And you know, I've got like. 75 bucks and I go, I can't even buy the materials for that. So yeah, you yeah. get a fingernail for that, my friend. <laughs> I'll teach you how to do it, maybe, but you get a fingernail. Yeah, exactly. And the thing is, is yeah. this, it's, it's, so you ask a very questions, all artists, no artist loves to market themselves. They feel, you know, they figure their head is humble as the dust, blah, blah, blah. Right. And the thing is, is that you love your work or you wouldn't be doing it and you don't want to give it away. So this is one of the things that I teach a lot of artists. I try to help them. You know how miserable you are when you're not doing what you love. So charge them for those hours, those hours of pain. What is it? What do you know? Oh, I don't want to be here not doing anything for a full day. I'm going to go stir crazy. Many people know what this is. It's called the pandemic. And so if you think about what stir craziness you're going through, what would it cost it for them to do that? Because for fun, we know we practically do it for free. Not really, but practically. So what mm -hmm. you want to do is if you've got a beautiful puppet and it's a one of a kind, right? You've created a beautiful puppet and it's a one of a kind. And that one of a kind, what's that one of a kind going to do? So you have a client coming to you and they say to you, I need a puppet. And you say, okay, but after you say, okay, and this is, oh, look how wonderful, adorable. Oh, how are you doing there? He's a, <laughs> he's a, he's a jackalope. I'm from Wyoming. You <laughs> are? I am. That, that's awesome. He's a, he's a mythical creature. That's a golden right here. She can see me, can't she? <laughs> I think so. I see? Sure can see you. I'm not mythical. I see All right. you. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> And yeah. if he talks more. Yeah, yeah, right? exactly. More, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So so this is the same with when you're doing your characters. What is your jackalope going to be doing? Is he going to be just in front of children performing? Is mm -hmm. he going to be in a TV commercial? Is he going to be in a movie? Is he going to be the, the logo? Because sure. if many artists will say, uh, I'll do it for three grand, let's say. I'll mm -hmm. build this character for three grand. And the person goes, oh, that's lovely. It's so much lower. But what they don't realize is the artist is retaining the rights to that design. Sure. Okay. So they may have brought you a picture, but you are creating this character. You would then retain the rights to this three-dimensional design. They have the rights to the two-dimensional design. You have the rights to the three-dimensional design. If they try to put that design in a movie, you as the artist can come back and go, uh, excuse me. Right. Did you, right. did we talk? Did we talk? No, we didn't talk. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm one of these people who's more upfront. And by that, I mean that I'm going to charge you a lot to build the puppet because you will get all rights. I will relinquish all rights. Sure. So to have me build a character is about $10,000, $15,000. Because you are buying all the rights. Yeah. So these are some of the things as a builder you need to find. Because somebody's going to make it their logo. Somebody is saying, I'm going to do it just for kids. I'm going to do it this. But many people come up and they go, this is going to be the spokesperson of my company. And so you're going to say, okay. You either, and they can go shopping. But they need mm -hmm. to be sure and ask an artist, is this for exclusive rights? Because many artists do not sell their exclusive rights. They keep that. Yeah. I do because I don't want to keep track of it. Really don't. Well, and also, you know, from a puppet builder standpoint, you know, I get to the point where I'm like, I don't want to build that again, even if it was for the same person that has the rights. You know what I mean? So it's like if you can sell the rights for, you know, whatever additionally and go, because it's like if your time's valuable valuable and you want to see how how you can pattern things differently or approach different techniques and building the same thing over might allow you to do that but it also kind of locks you into something yeah it like, does it, yes exactly so so, uh, so that's exactly the point 
Mm -hmm. If they're very special and, and you're never going to get to build it again, it might be something that's really super califragilistic, expiatodocious. You really enjoy doing it, but it belongs to somebody else. Right. And you can say to them, okay, or you think it's really going to hit, you know, it's really going to make pay dirt like the voices of the, of the Simpsons did mm -hmm. um, that became this little thing that they did. And the next thing, you know, it's everywhere and they have careers for the rest of their life and enough beach houses wherever they want. You know, these are people thinking that's the way it's going to be. It's not that it isn't. It's just that you now decide right here at ground zero what you want to do for it and to make sure that it, you know, that it that it's it's doing what you, you want. And the best way to do that is to create, post, and people are going to come looking for you. That's how they do it. And that's how Outrageous Pumpkins found me. They found my DVD. Oh, really? They watched it and they said, let's find mm -hmm. out if this girl wants to be a contestant. And I said, no, I want to be a judge. And they went, what? <laughs> You're like, so I've again, got the experience. Yeah. I don't, you could win $10,000 as a judge. I can have a coffee while everyone else is sweating it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can watch them suffer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> To. So, you know, it's all about knowing what you want in life and having the, the, the wherewithal, having the confidence to ask for it because you know you're worthy and you are worthy. You're special. You were born a human being, not a goose. And human beings are special and jackalopes are special. Thank so, you. I was going to say I was born a little, I was created, right? But yeah. I was uh, created as a jackalope, right? Yeah. So that's good. You have the, you want to ask the next question, Jackie? Sure. Then I got to go. Right. Yes. Okay. So go ahead. <laughs> okay. So, um, so you sculpted Thirst Slash Mountain. How did that come to be? And were you able to suggest what you wanted to work on for that project? Or were you assigned tasks? <gasps> I'm done. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. There we go. <laughs> he did it without a breath too. <laughs> I know. He's so, such a, he's such a professional. <laughs> he is a very professional. I, I used Thank to love you. jackalopes when I was a kid. And oh, my cool. parents would go, he's a mythical creature. And I would go, no, -uh, he's right here in this postcard. So <laughs> people would say, eh, you know. But to answer your question, um, mm -hmm. after I finished doing Dragon's Lair in Paris, which has a giant dragon in it, which again, I pursued because dragons, I love dragons. Mm -hmm. um, they said there's going to be a lull. And when you are a freelancer, I was hired by Disney, but then Disney decided that that maybe they wanted to go a different direction. So now they, they, they hire some many people as employees, but the rest they do from a hiring agency. Then if they like it, they make you an employee. But back in my day, I was an employee and they finally said, okay, Terry. And I said, well, that's okay. I'm going to go over and work on Muppet 3D. I'm going to work on the movies. I'm going to work Disney films with Jim Henson. I did Muppet 3D theater and things of that nature. And then I worked for Donald Trump not on a campaign, but I sculpted his Taj Mahal sign for Atlantic City. Oh, wow. So it was me and two others, and we sculpted this giant sign for his Atlantic City. And it was really a dream job because he was paying me an exorbitant amount of money. And he was also telling me, well, not him, his foreman, was telling me that I could only work 40-hour weeks, where in the film industry, a 40-hour week is golden because most of the time you're working like 70 hours. Got to get it done. Got to get right, it done. Right. But basically, <laughs> I got this call. It was a frantic call from a friend of mine who was overseeing Splash Mountain, Tokyo. And she said, Terry, I got to get you in here. You got to get in here. I need you. I need you. We're three weeks behind. We got to catch up. We got to catch up. So I was in the film industry and I carved foam. The foam was a lot like you put your flowers in the reservoir, that soft kind of scratchy foam. It comes in various pounds, pounds of pressure but we use it a lot to create rocks and things in the film industry. I was extremely fast because in the film industry, when they hire you, you say, how much time have I got? They say, um, last week. And you're like, Oh, but Disney says we, we, we're on a deadline. We're on a serious deadline. Oh my gosh. You really got to work fast. Okay. When's your deadline? Um, nine months from now, <laughs> excuse me. What? <laughs> oh, wow. What? Nine months yeah. from now. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So, uh, so she was three weeks behind. She brought me in. She had me come in. I went in 
and the person who is the guardian of the gate, uh, uh, employee relations said, okay, I see that you made X when you left. So we're going to pay you X now. And I went, no, you're not. And this again is, do you have the confidence? Do you want to go into Disney and work for what you worked for before? Or what do you want to do? I did not. I said, I just finished working for Donald Trump at three times that. You don't have to pay me three times that, but you're going to have to come up. Right. And she was like, Ugh. and she says, well, we can't. I said, okay, thank you very much. And I got up and I walked out. The door just about clicked before she called me back. And she said, you were really going to leave. I said, I thought we were done. Again, it's not that I'm really anything, but I just believe that, I, you know, oh, yeah. I had a call. I need you to catch us up. She didn't say, I need Ralph to catch us up. I need Terry right. to catch us up. I happen to know I'm really fast. So you take me and catch up or you don't take me and you don't. It's very simple. And uh, she gets on the phone. And she says, she calls up to where, I guess, the powers that be were going to hire me. And she's like, um, this girl is really, really weird. She wants more money. Do we really need to hire her? And the, you know, like Charlie Brown on the other end. Wah, 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 wah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. she's really strange. Wah, 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 wah. But, but she's really, really strange. <laughs> And I'm like, you are in front of me. I'm sitting here going, <laughs> whatever. So oh, did you sit that down or were you, were you right at the door when she's like on the phone? No, we're right sitting. Now I'm sitting down with her again. Oh, okay, and she's you, like, and so she says, they want to see you. So she sends me up to the model shop at Imagineering. And I sit in front of the, the supervisor and the supervisor rocks back and he says, you're a real strange cat. And I said, okay. And he said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to hire you as an independent contractor and the money is going to be X, Y, Z. What do you think? And I went, keep going. And he said, we're going to try out for two weeks. And if we like you, you can stay the full nine months of the project. And he said, he said, deal. And I said, well, I said, I'll tell you what, I'll work two weeks. And if I like you, I'll stay. And he went, oh, you really are weird. You know, <laughs> because it's Disney. People are like, ah, 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 ah. don't right, be right. that dog. Okay, mm -hmm. don't be that dog. They're a corporation. They're not family. Okay, mm -hmm. Disney, Universal, all of them. They're wonderful companies to work for. But put it in perspective. Remember, they're a business. So you can love there. And I loved working for Disney. The perks were tremendous. I'm not going to lie. But you've got to go in with your game face in business. If you really know that you're someone they want, go in. You don't need to take them to the cleaners, but know that they're looking at you to solve a problem. And that's sure. a big deal. So I went in and my friend Ann greeted me and she said, I need this Splash Mountain roughed out as quickly as possible. So I have some special tools I use because I know this material very well. And I went in at six o'clock in the morning. Everybody else comes in at eight. I went in at six. I blocked out, which means to take blocks of foam. And then I took two tools, jumped up on the mountain and just started like a Cuisinart. <coughs> because I was building a mountain, Splash Mountain. The first thing you need to do is break a solid block up to look like something other than a building. Because you're putting all these blocks and so all I did was just do this, like, you know, ki Yeah, yeah, yeah. And after two hours, the dust cleared. There was a mountain there and about 150 Imagineers staring at me. I turned around and went, oh, hey. <laughs> and Ann turned to the supervisor and said, we'll be caught up in a week. And I said, this is just the, because this is the way you work. If you... As, and as a woman there's you're going into a man's world it's going to be a man's world so as a woman you can sit there and lament about it oh i really wish it wasn't a man's world or you just go in and kick butt and take names so yeah. i sculpted a giant 
a Godzilla, Mrs. Godzilla for a parade. It was all men. I pulled out a chainsaw, you know, and now you've got this female with a chainsaw, dust clears, there's an animal there. And they're all like, whoa, you know, why it should be woe, gender makes no difference in your ability. Was it, was it a friendly environment or did, did you feel like, like there was something to prove on every, every project because of? Oh, I don't know. Sometimes it's a friendly environment. Sometimes uh-huh. it's a weird environment. Sometimes it's uncomfortable just because you're one woman in a sea of men. I think the same would be if you're one guy in a sea of women. However, the guys don't seem to mind it. A but as, as a woman, with, with all these men around, especially if they're scowling and going, what are you doing here? So, so there's a right. perfect story I can tell you where I was sculpting the texture on the Splash Mountain boat and doing the rabbit. And they said, the boat's too big to do in the sculpture studio at Imagineering, so we're going to put you over in Maypo. Well, let me tell you that a barbershop for a lot of men is a very sacred place. Nowadays, I guess you have women barbers and, and men barbers. But at the time, like in my dad's day, when my dad used to bring me into the barbershop as a little girl, all the men would be like, really? To my father. Now we got to behave ourselves, okay? Because right, right. <laughs> we have a little girl in here. Thanks, mm-hmm. you know? So this was what Maple felt like. That's where they do all the animal animatronics. They figure out the functions for the boats. They figure out how the characters are going to move. It's it's got computers. It's got uh, it's got hydraulics. It's got all the cool stuff. Right. And um. And then this girl walks in. This lady, whatever you want to say, I say girl, but the girl walks in. She's got her toolbox, and she's making her way to the center of your area. And every face is like, what in the world is she doing here? And I sit down by this boat structure and I have to make all of this shape. Now I got to make this boat look like a log or a pair of logs. And I look up and there's just men standing like this and staring. And you go, oh, this is going to be fun. You know, I can cut this atmosphere with a knife. Mm -hmm. So Disney saw the situation. So they came up with this amazing idea. They put a curtain all the way around me (laughs) and my boat. (laughs) So I didn't have to see see all these men glaring at me. I just had to feel them glaring at me. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Just because I can't see them doesn't mean I can't feel the atmosphere. And then I've got to go from the outside to my curtained area. And I see them all still angry, still not happy, not thrilled. And then I go inside my little curtain and pray I can work. You know, artists are often influenced by their exterior. Sure. I couldn't handle it. I thought this is ridiculous. What can I do to draw, to, to, to keep this, you know, I, I cannot change the fact that I am a woman. That's just not going to happen. So what can I do? So I noticed these men had marvelous faces. As a sculptor, I love people's faces. I love, I love, I tend to stare a lot because I just think the human face is one of the most beautiful things. And, and God is definitely the master when it comes to sculpting faces. Yeah. So I was just like, oh my gosh, this, you know, and some of them had, many of these men had the handlebar mustaches that did all this kind of stuff. Their hair was different. So I took some very soft clay and I started to make these little cartoon characters about this big based on them. Very simple cartoon, but they would have a big mustache. If it had glasses, I would make the glasses. And like, again, uh, thing, I would reach out of the curtains and I would set them on a shelf that was probably about a foot away from me or two feet away from me. So I'd open the curtain, look both ways, set this on the shelf and go back in. Okay. And I made about a half a dozen of me. I made about six of these when I was working on my boat very quietly. And I heard two guys talking amongst themselves as they walked by and they stopped. And one said, what are those? I don't know. What are they? That one, is that you? What do you mean? That looks like you. Is that you? I don't know. Is that what you? <laughs> I don't know. And then the curtain parted. Oh, that's so Win funny. for me. Yeah. Curtain yeah. parts. 
Are these us? Yeah. Did you make them? Yeah. Can we have them? Yeah. Oh, man. And so they would pick up their little guy. This one's me, right? Yeah. This one's him, <laughs> right? Yeah. And they would take them and put them on their toolboxes. And I just kept oh. doing different guys, different guys, different guys. I tell people, don't hate, appreciate. So find out something you appreciate about these people who are so angry and see if you can change it. Now, it could have gone the other way. Full disclosure, they could have been angry. But I just wanted to do something that would break the ice. And the walls yeah. of Jericho came tumbling down. All of a sudden, the curtain went, curtain went down. The apparatus was taken away. And I was able to sculpt amongst everybody. And that was simply because I took the time to do something that they found very endearing. And these little gremlin-y, whatever they, little heads of all these people were all over. You know, it took me maybe five, 10 minutes to sculpt them. And then I would set them out. And then all of a sudden people would, then there's a line. Will you do me? Will you do me? Will you do me? And you say, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So on my break, I would be. Yeah. But then you've broken the ice in your friends. So, so I never really looked at it as, oh, I got to prove myself again. I just kind of said to myself, I've kind of chosen a profession. Like if you're a fireman and you want, you're a woman and you want to fight fires, you know, you're going into an environment that you're going to have to make some adjustments. And sure. I think if you want to do it bad enough, you'll make some, and then you'll teach by teaching them the kind of person you are, you help them to better understand it's not as bad as they believe. Okay. Mm -hmm. Many firemen believe there was fight. Women could not do what a fireman could. And now we know that there are women out there lifting tons more than a lot of men do. And if they want to be a firefighter, they can do it. Right. But they right. just show I'm not, you don't have to worry about me. I'm not the kind that's a shrinking violet. I'm someone who's going to fight the fire. And that's the thing you got to teach. If you teach people by being the best example of yourself that you can, this is how they learn. Okay. So you kind of make the decision. Did that ever get tiring? Like feeling like you always had to like prove, prove yourself as an artist or, or to your, to your peers, or was it like a challenge and you're like, okay, I'm at a new place. I'll, I'm ready to take it on. I mean, I think that doesn't matter when you, wherever you are, you got to prove something. You go into a new school, doesn't matter with your boy or girl, you got to prove you're cool. Right. You know, they're all going to do a pecking order and do mm -hmm. it all the time. New horse gets in a corral. They all start to bite her because they want to see what she's got, or they start to bite him and they want to see what he's got. Animals and you coming into a new pride, meerkats, lions, it's all the same. You're going to have to prove yourself male or female, right? So sure. the thing is, is you look at that and you look at the animal kingdom and say, I'm not going to sit here and cry because I have to prove myself. I'm going to show you. And it's going to be, you want to do it by just simply teaching them that you don't have to, well, in some cases you do have to fear me. All right. I'm coming in and auditioning for this job and I'm going to give it everything I got. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not going to sit here worrying about my gender. You know, I'm going to give it everything I've got. You brought me in to do a job. I'm going to do the job. So, sure. but you can do it with, with humor and with a smile and say, you know, you want to be upset because I'm a woman and not upset because I'm good at what I do, you know, and I can only say it from a woman's point of view because I'm a woman, but I'm sure right. there's other people who have had the same challenges no matter you know what they face, there's people who are afraid of gay people. Well, I think if you meet a gay person, they're not all out to convert you. Right. But those people who have an overblown idea, you know, they're gonna mm. they're gonna convert me. They want me to be like them. No. Right. They just want to live their life. We all just yeah. want to live our life and be treated properly and respectfully. So I really don't care what you like or who you're going to vote for or whatever. It's just, if you're a jerk, if you're a jerk, you need to get out of my dance space. Cause I'm not interested. That's basically my criteria. Oh, jerk, I love nice that. That's, that's a great philosophy to live by. Yeah. That's, Talk to the hand if you're a jerk and move back. <laughs>
I love it. Now we have this photo here. Can you talk a little bit about this? It's not the best. Well, quality. Imagineering, speaking of proving yourself, doesn't matter, male, female, child or whatever. They mm. come to you and they go, well, if you want to be in the sculpture department, we got to see if you can sculpt. That makes sense. Even though a lot of animators today don't necessarily draw, I don't get that, but okay. <laughs> So right. I had to do this sculpture. They gave me a picture of Br'er Fox. I had a little Br'er Fox. I brought that in. They looked it over. Then they said, okay, Terry, you get to advance to the next level. Big Br'er Fox head. So I did a big Br'er Fox head and uh, I brought it in. One of the most uncomfortable moments of my life was I bring it into the sculpture studio and they pull out things called calipers which I think I have a set here. So it's, it's so nice to be in my shop because all I have to do is pull these suckers out of here. But you have these things called calipers that look like this, right? Oh, yes. This one has a center. This has a center every, thing in the Every handle. specific detail and measurement. They went like this on my work. I'm standing in the side and they're going. Right, And they're right. writing stuff down and they're not talking to you, you know? <laughs> It's like if you think you have a terminal disease and the person is just writing on the chart and you go, you want to tell me what it is? Uh, you're okay, sir. Uh, and you're like, <laughs> why are you writing it down then if I'm okay, sir? You know? Right, right. <laughs> it was really scary. It was a sweaty palm moment. And you're like trying to, you know, you're saying, don't let them see you sweat. Don't let them see you sweat while they're crawling over like ants trying to see it's symmetrical. Nature isn't symmetrical, but when you are an animator who is creating mechanics for the fox to speak, they want it as symmetrical as possible. Mm -hmm. So when it's something that they're going to put a mechanic up inside, it's a lot easier if it's symmetrical. So I forced, sure. again, my sculpture to be symmetrical. Annoying, but, you know, uh, it really helped the mechanics. And then all of a sudden the mechanics are requesting you. We call that job security. Uh <laughs> How far does does um do they need you in that process? Like well, like I sculpted, they have someone else, another imagineer, or someone else on the team, kind of take what you've done and go with it. In the case of the fox, I wasn't an imagineer yet, but they took that oh, okay. head. I thought they were just gonna mush it because it's an right. audition piece, right? But mm -hmm. they loved it so much they put it in Splash Mountain, and then they came and told me, "You're hired," and we put it in Splash Mountain. And you're like, "Excuse me, what?" Because I was expecting it to, you know, it's an audition piece. Who thinks it's going to go all the way? But they liked it. I said, oh, well, that's cool. And then I did, you know, and then I started to do these things like, well, Dragon's Lair is a perfect example. I did the entire show. So Dragon, how the dragon's going to be animated, how the wings are going to work, how it breathes, how it looks, how the cave feels, what the cave looks like, what the color of the cave is, the whole attraction in Paris is my design. Now I have some restrictions. There's a building that I have to make sure the I don't breach a wall or anything. There was a staircase coming down from Merlin's magic shop I had to incorporate. But for the most part, I was creating the tops and the bottoms and how the dragon would be and everything. And so we don't usually so go ahead. Was it just you or were you like the team lead and visionary behind it? And you had like people that would do like the smaller tasks to kind of Paris had to be done so quickly, they couldn't give me a partner. So I did wow. it myself at first. And then they said, and this is what happened. At first, the dragon wasn't going to move. And I said, oh my gosh, what are we, Magic Mountain, Universal? We don't do this. Disney doesn't do this. <laughs> and so my supervisor was like, yeah, yeah, well, you're preaching to the choir here, Terry. I have no power. Well, who has power then? Well, right. Tony Baxter has power. Well, who is this Tony Baxter? A lot of Disney people love when I say that because they all know who Tony Baxter is. But I didn't. I didn't know who Tony Baxter was. Senior VP of Imagineering. Okay, so can he get down here? Can we get him down here? No, you don't just get the senior VP. Oh, so can I go to him? You know, how do we fix this? How do we make this? Right, right. How do we change this? This is wrong. And so he's like, oh, okay. Jerry, come on. Oh, you're a pain. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. If I call Tony and ask him to come down here because one of my Imagineers needs to talk to him about a dragon slayer, can you keep it to 20 minutes? Okay, I'll do it. So, <laughs> so 
Tony comes with his entourage, a lot like uh -huh. Michael Jackson. Um, right. Tony comes in with his entourage, a lot of people. He's got someone who puts the chair down for him. He sits down. People to make sure he's got something to write. People make sure he got something to drink. And he looks up at me like this when he's ready. Now I'm dressed in a, in a, in a white lab coat, okay? Just keeps the foam off me. I like it. I illustrate them usually. So yeah. it had a dragon going across and I was like this. So I looked like someone on the starting blocks for the Olympics and I was hovering and he looked up and he went and he said, are you Terry? And I said, yes. Are you Tony? And he said, yes. And I said, say go. And he's like, what? Say go. Okay. And go. And I said, okay, here's the thing about the dragon. It can't be, it can't be stone. We're not universal. We're not magic man. We're Disney. And when we're Disney, we make it animate. And the way to make it animate is to do the claw like this, like a dog, have the tail go like this, like a cat, have this breathing. Fire comes out of the mouth. And he says, wait, stop. Wow. <laughs> and I'm like, You're like checking your time. Yeah. <laughs> I still have 15 minutes left. You're cramping my style. Yeah. Yeah. And he just goes, Act like this and he starts laughing and he says look kid, if this means that much to you if I give you more time will you slow down and I said yeah and I walked him through all my concept art I acted out how I wanted the dragon to be I told him how I wanted the floor how I wanted the head how I wanted to create this emotion in people when they walked in and he said, okay, we'll, we'll change it. We won't make it a stone dragon. Oh, thank God. But the only way it's going to be a real dragon is if you do it. And I went, okay. Now, note to all you guys out there, had I ever designed a ride in my life? Did I have any idea how to even start? But no way in Hades was I not going to take this on. Okay, so you're going to be scared. The butterflies, yeah, they were going in my stomach like butterflies in a jar. I was scared to death, but I said to myself, I'm going to design it the way I want to design it. And they'll come in and do their two cents. And that's what I did. I, I love dragons. I made the dragon move the way I believed it wanted to move. I made it live the way I wanted it to live. I did the cavern the same way. And they came in and they brought a guy in to work with me because they were nervous at being a woman because now we're going to go to Paris and the chief overseer is going to be a woman. The problem with that is people that are Italian and people who are French might not necessarily take orders from a woman. Worse right. than U.S., okay? So mm. Disney wants the shortest distance between two points because we don't got a lot of time to build this park. So they sat me down and they said, we're sorry, Terry, we cannot send you there to, to build your, your, your thing. So I said, all right, I get it. I get it. I don't really think it's fair, but that's okay. Let's forget fair. Let me pick the guy. So I chose the guy that was going to be going over there and he did everything exactly like my model. I did a model about one to 10 scale model and then they built it big, right? So I went layers later and I walked into the dragon's lair and there were things only I knew about because I had put certain things in the attraction. And when I saw these things duplicated so precisely, I burst into tears. I must have cried through the entire attraction. I look at it. Oh, oh, you know, because this is there for years. It's going to be there long after I'm gone. And this How is what many artists dream. The whole project. It to do a lot. The whole project took us. I think we were pretty much on time. We went, we, we built it and we had it all ready to go about nine months into it. And the cool thing is that uh, Tony Baxter came to see me and said, of all the attractions in the park, everyone's voted the best attraction is not even an attraction. And it's your dragon's lair. Number one ride in Paris. Number one attraction. And the reason is because every castle has to have a dragon, especially in Paris. 
Paris is the castle capital of the world. The thing that makes it the best Disney castle of all time is because there's a dragon sleeping underneath. A 35-foot, fully articulated, fire, fire and smoke, breathing dragon. You actually get to experience the, the awe and mystery of being face-to-face -face with a dragon. And I am so proud of it. You can tell um, that I'm so yeah. proud of it because it's it's so majestic and so beautiful. And we did that. I was in 2000 was the first time I went to visit her because she was opened in what, 97, 98. So now you go and people still love her. So, and I understand my fan, you know, people who've gone to see the dragon say it's a her. So I go, okay, it's her, you know. Have you named it yet? Anybody? Anybody name it yet? And they go, no, no, no. Right now, we just are calling it the day. They go, why didn't you name it? I said, I don't name it. It's for the fans. You guys name it. You're supposed to name it. Get on it. You know, <laughs> but they just call it the dragon underneath the castle. And they've all decided it was a she. But it's uh, it's really, it's just a really beautiful. And people, some people go to Disneyland Paris and don't even know it's underneath there. They miss. I love that it stands the test of time. I mean, that's how you know that it really is a, a staple. I, I just absolutely well, love that. Well, you know, Landon, when you're passionate about something, it's going to, mm -hmm. I am a dragon freak. Gosh, if I want to sculpt one thing, it's going to be a dragon doing something. And I put mm -hmm. them in, I mean, I doodle dragons. I love them so much. But when you're passionate behind something like that, you can be successful without even trying because all of your love, your joy, your bone, your flesh, your your blood goes into that piece, doesn't it? It and does, yeah. It, you, can't, you can't help but win. You can't help but win every single time. And everybody was like, "It's aren't you surprised it's number one? Not really. <laughs> the yeah, dragon was created by a dragon nut. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if you see that from people, it's something you really love. Like when you go to Tokyo Disneyland and you see Winnie the Pooh, you can tell that all of these uh, Imagineers were so grateful and had so much fun and a lot of passion because Japan said, they said it's going to cost about 18 million to do this, this attraction. And I think many Imagineers were used to the U.S. They were kind of like, waiting for the counter, right? It's going to take right. 18 million to do it. What are we going to have mm -hmm. to cut? And Japan said, hmm, what if we give you 21 million? And they went. And the joy of creating that, that attraction in uh, the Magic Kingdom, Tokyo, is just, you get on it and you just, your, your whole body. And, and in Shanghai, the Pirates of the Caribbean ride, I thought, I'm not going to like it because it's a lot of computer generated stuff. Uh, contraire, mon ami. It is the best blending of live action animatronics and CG that I've ever seen. And that's the way I think CG really works is if you take CG and you work with audio, the full on practical, you mix the practical with the CG. It's so much nicer to see a cute, a uh, computer generated flight sequence instead of to try and doing something like the black hole where you see the strings, you know, now we have the right. ability to take a computer and make something really fly. Let's do that. But when it's on the ground, mm -hmm. let's also remember that pe actors work better opposite objects, not green stuff. They can do the best they can, mm -hmm. but if they can see, touch, feel, and experience that object, that helps bring them into the characters or whatever they're creating. So if it needs to fly, take that practical ship that's landed and fly it. But just go back and forth, rock between the two mediums. It's not either or, it's always and. Mm -hmm. Wow, I absolutely love that. Kind of um, going back to earlier when we were talking about Splash Mountain, um, what is your what were your thoughts when you heard about it being possibly rethemed. I don't know what the current status is, but they were saying that um, due with the times, I think they were going to retheme it to uh, Princess and the Frog. You kind of wonder about that, okay? Half black, mm -hmm. half white, that's me. Everybody's asking me this question. What do you think about this? What do you think about this? Okay, so here's, here's what I think about it. There's a movie that has Spencer Tracy in it. If you don't know who Spencer Tracy is, Google it. And it's Spencer Tracy. <laughs> 
Spencer Tracy, and it's about the monkey trials. It's called uh, uh, Inherit the Wind. It's the original Inherit the Wind, okay? okay. Uh, it's about a man who decides to teach Darwin when creation is the only way, only thing this state believes, that man was created by God. There is no Darwin, okay? The whole okay. state had this and it was a law you could not teach darwin you only taught creation so he was brought up on trial and they made a movie about it called inherit the wind probably 1956 1957 it's black and white if you don't like black and white get over it. it's an incredible movie go there for the message okay? okay the message is this if you let anything get too out of hand and get too crazy People who are upset that the word that manhole cover is called manhole cover, that's nuts. Get over yourself. We're not going to call them person covers. Get over yourself, okay? Calm down. I get if you're offended by some things, but let's not go crazy, all right? So this is kind of the thing that I like about Inherit the Wind. It talks about, you know, there's the wonder of the planes, you know, it's great to fly from A to Z, but the birds will lose their wonder, you know? And so when I heard about Splash Mountain and they thought it was racist, Splash Mountain is not about Uncle Ramus or any of that stuff. There is no tar baby in Splash Mountain. It's about zippity doo dah, happy things, joyful experience, but okay. If there's people out there who are offended and upset, Disney will consider it. I will tell you right now, and I'm not an authority, I don't think Disney will replace it with the Princess and the Frog. And the half black side of me is a little irritated. What did they do? Look at every Disney film to see if they could find which one had the black princess? Uh, How many? Uh, How many? One. Right, right, yeah. Okay, now, See, this is what bugs me. It drives me, okay, it's gotta be not racist. Let me see. This one has a black prisoner. Isn't that still the same problem? I'm just asking. I'm not here. I don't have no catalytic converter on my mouth. So this is the first thing I thought. I love Princess and the Frog. Yeah, but as Tony great. Baxter, Tony Baxter said, we got other problems with Princess and the Frog. We can't just say, okay, Splash is now going to be Princess and the Frog because there's a little thing that happens in Princess and the Frog called voodoo. Oh. And voodoo offends other people. Right. You see? So Disney <laughs> has to... <I> can't win. <laughs> you say to yourself, oh, yeah, yoy, you know, and this is what Tony said. We can't just jump to Princess and the Frog. It'd be great to do a Princess and the Frog thing, but we've got some challenges with voodoo. And I agreed, you do. But one of the things I did with my with my uh, group on my Patreon page, we have this great community of creative people and they keep growing every day. And I really didn't know what my Patreon page was gonna be. And then I get these wonderful people who are so flipping creative. It's just one, and those who are not. So people come to that page to learn how to do what they want to do from people who know how to do it. And the community is growing and I am not even in there as much as I could be because these people are all jumping in and helping each other. And I jump in to see how they're doing. It's, it's, it's amazing. But my point is, as I said, let's take it in a different way. Splash Mountain is not being singled out because people think it's racist. I said to my group I said, Let's say Splash Mountain's a little dusty. It's a little old. After all, they took the America Sings characters and plopped them into Splash Mountain. So they didn't really change them at all. They just changed, they know their animation was the same, but they just changed the words. So maybe people are getting a little tired of the mountain. How can we make it different? And this is what I gave my group, I said, if you were going to design a Splash Mountain, what would you design it as? And forget, don't worry about whether it's racist or not. Just say, what would you do? Now, here are some criteria that Disney would love if you find a Splash Mountain. You use the same mountain. You just tweak it a little bit. It's still a water ride. You just tweak it a little bit. Okay. Can you use the same track? 
Because if you can use the same track and use the same spots allocated for show, this saves money. Okay. Sure. So as a designer of attractions, this is what you would do if you were going to do this on social media. And one of my guys came up with uh, Moana. And oh, I said, wow. oh my God, that's amazing. And he broke it down to every point in Splash Mountain. He did the, the Moana that would fit there. And it's fabulous. So you, you say to yourself, many people will want to gather on a Patreon page or watch my lives because it's a place to come out of the in from the cold and not be dealing with the magma that we're all dealing with. Yes, I will touch on the pandemic and occasionally I will get political. I don't really want to because you're not going to win that battle, but sometimes right. someone will ask me a question and it will hit a nerve. Roe versus Wade is one of those nerves. So mm -hmm. I do know that I don't have a catalytic and a converter in my mouth. And I say, just give me a grain of salt, guys. Every once in a while, you're going to strike a nerve. And I'm going to just say what I'm going to say. But I'll get back to my happy-go-lucky self so you can come in from the cold and not worry about everything that's creepy outside. But that's why instead of complaining about or, or battling in the magma of was it or was it not racist, we got rid of all of that and said, we're now Imagineers. We're putting the hat on. What are we going to design? And wow. this is what, there were many other ideas. This is the one that we all went, wow, that's incredible. That is just, and one of the girls in there pulled up the, the you know, she found the, the, the map of Splash so that you could see where it goes and where it's all the drawing. She posts that on our page. And so the person who was designing, when we were all designing, we could say, okay, this here, this here, this here, right down to, uh, on Splash Mountain, there's a wood carving of uh, Br'er Bear and Br'er Fox. Uh -huh. You would pop him out and put the god there. You know, you would. Oh, wow. uh, he would. Be, and how beautiful would he be? And how many people are going to pose with him? Because not only is he a really attractive god, but he's also mm -hmm. <laughs> the Rock. So. Yeah. <laughs> He's got a double, so it's very clever. It's 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 again, like you said, it's the it's that cleverness that people are coming up with, that you, you you throw away all that magma and say, hey, rather than get myself all buried under that, what if we just change it? It's fun. Yeah, now we, we don't know that yeah, Disney's going to do it. Well, what we if know. I mean, can Disney do that? Can they can they like go to fan forums and, and things, communities like that, and 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 pull from it, or do they have to like? talk to the people that created the ideas or you're they're like oh it's disney it's our movie we're just going to take that and run with it i mean do you well well um <laughs> like the uh like the uh the turtle in kung fu panda i don't know but <laughs> the thing is <laughs> the thing is is that on a patreon page it's a private thing and i said that's what as imagineers they'll come to us as imagineers and say this ride's getting old who has ideas you blue sky it you sit there and right. you create it you know um they used to have a council of advice of fans who would advise them on merchandise on what they like because you can really work hard thinking what people are going to enjoy or you can ask people, what do sure. you want? What what would be cool? What what you know? What would it be fun? You know, and that's how my art happens. Is I ask people, what do you want next? You know, what is it you're missing in your in your in your life? So Disney stopped doing that, and I think especially in merchandising, they're really lacking. I think of all the things that they've created, the thing that really has exploded and really actually is a nice piece as far as construction, because mm -hmm. you can get something that's a nice idea, but the construction of it, you go, what were they thinking here? You know, right. is the child. The child has so many different versions and most of them are pretty doggone cool. You know, just the soft little little rubber skin and everything. I don't own one, but boy, is, my fans just tell them they love it. What is your take on uh, The Mandalorian? That's the best thing, man. They should have stopped doing Star Wars Seven. Oh Lord have mercy! They should have never made that movie. You want to? Yeah. You want to stab me in both eyeballs? Give me a <laughs> Clockwork Orange feeling. Just show me Star Wars Seven. How dare they even pull that out? You might as well trace. 
You know, here's another yeah. movie where they said, oh, we'll make it different by putting in a black guy and a woman. <laughs> right. And I'm like, how dumb do you think I am, fool? J.J. Abrams right. like everyone can tell it's worse. And it's not like they're against it or anything, but it's like it, it's just when it's 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 a little, you know, pushed out there too hard that it, it seems like they're trying to pander almost. Yeah, you're right. But I, you know, I was around in 77. This, these movies changed my life. This is why I'm here today. Star Wars. I actually got to tell George Lucas how much of a difference he'd made in my life. This is a big deal. So you don't insult me by making seven. Don't, don't upset me. Don't, don't write, don't phone it in, JJ. And every time you touch it, you need to just stop. Okay. Yeah. So I went to, a, I went to a screening and he was sitting, What I was in the second row. He was in front of that first row. Whole mm -hmm. time he was speaking, I was doing this. <laughs> I think they were going to do a Q&A until they knew I was going to get up on that microphone and rip him a new one. How dare he do such a horrible film? I was so yeah. mad. What do you think? I didn't watch the original Star Wars. You can put them side by side. Right down right. to hiding inside the Millennium Falcon so the Stormtroopers won't find you. How dumb do you think we are? It's one of the most frustrating things you can see. Yeah. There it goes. Blood pressure going up. Because I'm like, you, you gotta be kidding me. You could have burped and we would have went to see it. We were all so hungry for seven. And then you okay, treat so it like it's nothing. Toilet paper, right. it's not Walmart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the generic So then you do the Man Mandalorian. The Mandalorian, right. Favreau. Mm -hmm. Do you not think that Favreau was sitting in a chair near mine in 1977 and feeling what I felt because yeah. that show shows real heart shows real guts and is done by someone who loves what I love. You got to understand that you can't diss things like Disney and you can't diss things like star Wars because to the fans, they're family, yeah. they're Ohana. So you don't sit there and go, Oh, Disney, it's just a bunch of animated cartoons. Dude, watch your mouth. Okay, yeah. sister, watch your mouth. Because you're talking about somebody's family. And you need to show respect. So when you make a film like this last Star Wars film, seriously, I mean seriously, and they said it's the last one, all we're going is, oh, thank God. You know, yeah. the, the, the emperor or whatever his name was has it's a baby. Like Are you mad? Like, Where what did else you, can we like smoking? bring back to like continue this? Yeah. It, well, okay. Now here's an interesting. Here's another interesting question, Terry. Um, going kind of off of that, uh, Disney owning the Muppets. Um, that I don't know if they owned them when they did that Muppets The Office kind of spinoff. But then today, um, Mu what is it called? Uh, is it Muppets Now on Disney Plus? I think it's. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet, but I heard it was cute. Is it cute? Okay. Yeah. You know, um, as a big fan of the Muppets and not, you know, cause the problem is like, they don't stick to the character and they, they try to veer off on all these, like they're like stapled characters and they're like, Hey, why don't we just have them do this? Cause th the audience will like that. And they're like, you can't take a character and totally disregard everything that, that these performers have built up, um, in the, in the backstory and the history with the, and how they mingle with other characters. And it was, I think it was done I haven't seen all of the episodes. I watched a few of them. It's it's got kind of a a um a Muppets Tonight vibe in that they they kind of change from different scenes to scenes and the characters seem to be a lot like they kind of started to figure it out again. Like oh this is this is kind of what we should have been doing from the beginning. Um, but it's you should you watch know. the Muppet Show. Like watch the Muppet Show. Like the one that Jim did. Like the one that he designed. Because yeah. I'm going to tell yeah. you a secret. He designed the Muppets. Um, but, but you're absolutely right because, because these are your, what your family, yeah. you know, in Muppets tonight, one of the most offensive things they did was have Fozzie Bear steal. Fozzie mm -hmm. Bear would never steal. He steals an ashtray. I don't yeah. care what it is. He would not steal. That's not Fozzie. That's not mm -hmm. what Fozzie's about. And then Kermit is mean and Miss Piggy is mean. Miss Piggy was never mean. She was self-centered. She was narcissistic where it came, went to herself until she mm -hmm. looked at the frog. Love the frog. 
And the frog was a sweet, wholesome, kind character that stood up for himself. Not these mean, nasty, where do you get this? Why do you think you can do this to the characters? And then you get upset because we get offended and we don't watch. You know, you've got to stay true that you are so right. And that is exactly why. Well, you, you to me, I don't know, was it called The Muppets? And then it was, I mean, was that the what, what the show was called? It was like something very, very generic, but it was like The Muppets or something like that, or I don't know. But um, it, it was like, they're like, okay, well, we know that this generation love The Muppets, but they also like The Office. We'll combine them and see what we can bake. And it's like that's the one Muppets oof. tonight. And it's, it's it like was what you terrible. said earlier, and like we see how forced it is, and we see how it just did not work. And you, well, and it's surprising are, how. Like yeah. you said, they're not the characters. So if you watch the last three episodes or last four mm -hmm. episodes, where they get a clue and realize they're not doing it right. So they're pulling up, the plane is crashing and they pull up, but they didn't quite make it. So then it's dead, okay? Because people have already left. The last three episodes were really beautiful. There's one called something about a tale, tale of two piggies, I think it's called, where Miss Piggy goes to a gala and her tail pops out. I mean, she's a pig. So the tail pops out. Oh, everybody gets upset. And they start dissing her because her tail pops out, you know? And so Joan Jett is on the show and she talks about how you got to be who you are. You got to be yourself. That's mm -hmm. what the Muppets are about. The Muppets are yeah. about making you feel good about who you are. And you have friends of all different colors, all different types. You have Gonzo, whatever he is, an animal, and you have all these different and they all get along and they all care about each other. And this is why people love them. You have to keep the heart of something. You can't just cut the heart out and expect the body to move because it's gonna be this lifeless thing. You've got your zombie apocalypse happening. And that's why that's why that didn't work. And that's why a lot of the Star Wars movies didn't work. The closest was Rogue and then they killed off all the characters that were cool and you're kind of like that's pretty silly but mandalorian has nailed it mandalorian all the way through is just wonderful the only thing i didn't like was that they showed me what that mandalorian looked like and i really didn't want to know i yeah. really love the yeah. mystery of the mandalorian i liked that we didn't know what he looked like underneath that we were curious, but they were this order that believed that you do not ever in the presence of others. And I just thought, oh, I love that. That was just so delicious and cool. And yeah. then there's a female character that hangs around with them that is so badass. She's so amazing. She's not there because she's a woman. She's there because she's a fighter and she's tough and she's gritty, you know? Mm -hmm. She's like Princess Leia, only she's a different kind of, you know, it, it but, but, really, and not even really to mention, thought about it. Not even to mention, Terry, the what we talked about earlier with rides, the integration of, uh, uh, you know, puppetry and, you know, um, digital effects and all that stuff that you can do in post now. I mean, it was beautifully mm -hmm. blended. I mean, I, you know, some of the scenes are like, wow, this is uh, just, just with the little you know, child puppet. I mean, it's really going back and seeing some of these puppeteers that I follow on social media and you're like, oh, wow, I didn't even know that that scene was, um, you know, and, and even when they call back to the, um, what was it, when they had the, the stormtroopers, um, uh, I don't know, was it stormtroopers? I don't know, it was, it was someone, they were doing something about how they couldn't shoot properly. Um, mm -hmm. And they were going back and forth and I just, I, I love that. It was, you know, everything was was perfect for the fan base, but it wasn't shoved in your face and it wasn't overdone to the point of, you know, oh, we'll reach a new audience with this because it's got all this CGI. You know, it's like it's it's there and it's it's they respected. Didn't take the that's heart. What I think of. George yeah. Lucas shopped that thing around to everybody. Everybody laughed at him except for one man, Alan Ladd Jr., who looked at this script about a thing called a Wookiee, whatever the hell that is. And a ragtag group of, of vagabonds who are getting some message to the princess and there's some sort of squatty robot and then there's a gold robot and then there's a this and there's a that. 
And everybody was like, this is not going anywhere. Get out of my face. You bother me, kid. And then Alan said, I'll, I'll green light it. And in order for George Lucas to make this movie, he had to give the actors points. I'm sorry, I can't pay you what you usually make, but I'll pay you what I can and I'll give you points. Points are the gold. Points in a film. And all of a sudden, people who had said, this movie is a waste of my time, realized it was going to change the way we do everything. It made it a world, the world of love stories, which were annoying the teeth out of my skull. If I saw another love story, I was gonna vomit. And all yeah. of a sudden I was hungry. Like so many of us out there, we wanted to see fantasy. We wanted to see good fantasy. We wanted to see space battles, good space battles. We wanted to know about aliens. We wanted to know about monsters because the geeks of the world really liked that stuff. And all of a sudden, a geek named George Lucas said, I'm going to make this movie. And all of a sudden, there we were, so excited to see it. It made the room stretch for us. I know. I saw it 181 times. Why? Because it was life flipping, changing. I had never seen anything like this in my life. I knew that my hobby was now a career. I saw that chest sequence. I said, those are sculpted. I can do that. Monsters, I can make those. Yeah. And it's 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 one of those things when you're a kid and you're sitting in the theater and you see stuff like this, your heart's beating like a rabbit, you can't breathe, and all of a sudden you're seeing something magical. And my goodness, it's because a passionate man didn't quit. He knew he had something. And the next thing you know, our fashion is different. We're now making comic books as movies. All of that goes all the way back to a little film called Star Wars. And that's why when you take something as valuable as that, that nut, and you do something like Star Wars 7 or Star Wars 1 through 3 Phantom Menace, um, you feel like you're being slapped. You feel like someone is actually hurting you as you see characters and you go, I just don't get it. I don't get why you didn't read or you didn't. You didn't, you didn't study. You didn't right. in Ghostbusters. You didn't study. <laughs> yeah. You know? So I feel you. With Muppets, it's the same thing. And they knew it. You were referring to Ghostbusters. What, which, which specific Ghostbusters are you referring to? The first Ghostbusters, the one that I was in. Uh -huh. Um, the characters, the characters say, well, exactly what happens when the stream, yeah, Ray, what does happen with the streams? And then Ray turns and says, you didn't study <laughs> to the, to the Bill oh, Murray right, character. Right, right, right. You didn't study. Um, yeah. So that was yeah. a great film. And you did ask me if I got to be with the, with the actors. Yeah. In fact, I thought I was going to be fired by them because I had not watched Saturday Night Live and Bill Murray and Dan Aykroyd were, well, Bill Murray mostly said, we can't have someone on the set that hasn't seen Saturday Night Live. I didn't own a TV, so it was right. hard for me to see it back then. And uh, well, I well, said, I, you know, so, but I did. I, I spent a lot of time with them. I love that. I love that. And a few questions wrapping up here. Um, as a ventriloquist, uh, we talked earlier, you said uh, you have a Ron Lucas Henson story. Ron Lucas, one of the sweetest, most wonderful men in the world. And he's so big in Vegas, isn't he? He's just always doing a Vegas show, a Vegas show, a Vegas show, a Vegas show. Yeah. You know, I'm so proud of him. I'm just thrilled. And then I was on a, uh, a Disney cruise as a guest artist, and he was the, the headliner in the show. Yeah. So I, I, I texted him and said, I bet I, I, bet I know where you are. <laughs> and he went, what? And I said, guess who's on the same ship? And he's like, what? So I went in early and we caught up, but he's a really oh. lovely fellow. We got both cast in Muppet 3D uh, theater, which you can still see in Florida. Mm -hmm. We got cast to do this with Jim Henson. Okay. And Ron brought one of those little miniature sort of clown bikes where you sit on top of it and you pedal really fast. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, he had it. And so, because puppeteers are spending a lot of downtime and I told you we're wacky. So we were all doing right. this wacky stuff and, uh, the production wasn't really thrilled with us. It was like watching over kids, uh, you know, good luck Disney, but we're puppeteers. We're, we're kind of do what we do. 
But uh, it was a small break and Jim Henson came over to say hello to us and to see what we were doing. His eye caught this little bike. And he said to Ron, he said, who owns that? Or he said to us, who owns that bike? And Ron Lucas, you know, that's my bike. And Jim Henson said, really? And he said, yeah. And he says, you can ride it? And Ron says, it's easy. It's just like a regular bike. You're just down really tight, pedaling it. Jim says, can I try it? And Ron, you know, yeah, you can try it. I mean, you know, yeah. you feel you're going to have this shrine afterwards. You're never going to ride it awesome. again because Jim Henson is riding your bike. I would imagine right, that's right. what Ron was right. thinking. But so Jim gets on it and he starts to pedal. <laughs> And he loses control and he crashes into part of the set that's not lit yet. And the production gets really mad. Cut! Ah! Who's back here? Do it! And Jim says, my bad, my bad. I was riding a bike. I'm sorry. And they go, oh, oh, Mr. Hanson, it's no problem. No problem. You know, and, <laughs> and Ron is like. But he was so happy. He had, he got his little bike ridden by Jim Henson. So, you know, even though you have successes of your own, you still have mentors you've always admired that have gotten you to where you are. And you meet them and you kind of get like five years old again. Oh, my God, it's wow. you, you know. I love that. I love so was, was Ron yeah. performing as a ventriloquist during that time or was he just doing his puppet? No, we were puppeteers on that. Okay. He right. was doing right. some ventriloquism, but we were puppeteers mostly on that show. And okay. I think he was, I don't know if he was just breaking into Vegas or it was a hiatus or whatever, but, uh, sure. Sure. you know, we're, we're jack That's of all trades, thing. kind of, you know, you're a puppeteer, you're a ventriloquist, yeah. you're yeah. Not, not me, I'm not a ventriloquist now. But. <laughs> he was one of the first, uh, <laughs> I think he was the first uh, ventriloquist to really bring soft puppets into the stage performance of it. Uh, well, really you guys can make anything time. talk. That's the thing. Like, why does it have to be a ventriloquist dummy, which are a little bit scary anyway? So yeah, I go, yeah. you know, people would do those ventriloquist dummies, and I'm going, I'm thinking of Twilight Zone. I really don't want to. <laughs> yeah. But many, many ventriloquists said, well, it doesn't have to. Be. I can make anything talk. Look, that shoe is talking over there. You know, and you're like, that's the point, right? So I think I right, looked right. at that and did these really whimsical little characters, had them built these fun mm -hmm. little whimsical characters. And this is the beauty, I don't need to say it to you, but a, a puppet can actually help teach because a puppet can be racist and you're mm -hmm. gonna help that racist see their error of their ways. They can be, um, they can say all kinds of inappropriate things. I had a puppet break up with my boyfriend because for some reason in, in college, he just wouldn't take no for an answer. So I had a puppet dog and my puppet dog said, read my fuzzy little lips. You know, and he just loved the puppet because we're uh, talking to the puppet. And he said, but I, I love her. He said, She's too bad. She don't like you, dude. You know, <laughs> not for you, not for you, you know, and they just have, they're this bridge. They're this beautiful bridge that can help kids get through challenges that they're having sure. or uh, they can help adults. I don't can't tell you how many adults have put a puppet on and they just melt into it. I'm sure you've seen it. They yeah. melt right in. Oh my God. Oh, you know, it's just hilarious and it's just wonderful. So they yeah. are great. And I really love to see more ventriloquists doing actual puppet characters as opposed to the mm -hmm. dummies because I think it allows you, for one thing, they're lighter weight. Right. They're not mm -hmm. so heavy. So you can yeah, really have funny. fun. Yeah, much more fun than these heavy, and they're also not necessarily always this and this. Many can work like this, and this is natural for us to do. We've been doing it for years. So yeah. that's the kind of thing that I think gives you guys freedom now, where before in the early days, you really, you know, you're trying to rub, you know, pat your head and rub your stomach by making this a trigger thing to make that happen. It's like, why would anyone do that? I don't know. It's fine. But that may be why a ventriloquist of uh, days gone by when he puts his hand in here is a little alien for them, you know? So. Yeah. But it's, wait, it's amazing you know, how, it's amazing. how things have evolved and how the arts evolved. Um, Ari, what current projects are you working on or have you shared with your community that you'd like to bring, uh, bring about here? 
Oh, well, I, I have, I do these wonderful little sculptures for the, for um, collectors. Reason I do it is because I want them to have something of quality to collect. So I did okay. these little hitchhiking ghosts and I know you showed some pictures of them, but this is what their size is. So here's the base. And then mm -hmm. this is, um, this one is Professor Phineas. And the thing I had to have happen with the ghosts, because let's face it, there's a million hitchhiking ghosts out there. So mm -hmm. one of the things that they do is people always build them connected. So mine are separate because people wanted, you know, as you saw in the video, people mm -hmm. want to tuck them in spots and then they want them to illuminate. So they illuminate. You push a button on the back and they illuminate. Now in this camera, it may look like it's a light going on and off, but actually mm -hmm. it looks more like this. And I'll show you what it looks like because the eye is such a sensitive instrument, our own eye, that it's going to show us what things look like differently. So I did this shot here to show how they're actually wow. illuminating. So as you can see with the light off, they look like little ghosts. Fancy that. They look like little ghosts that are materializing. So in the case of Phineas, you'll notice the bag is partially hidden. And then there's light areas. There's dark areas. And that's what makes them so super, you know, really special. And then you tuck them on your shelf. Because you gotta let collectors, you know, know this is how beautiful they're gonna be. Is here they are on a shelf, and they're they just, even stand out against everything else you have there. That's yeah, wow. and you can see through them a little bit. If you look hard, you can see my Peter Pan ship going through Phineas, my my uh, Mattel doll back there. I did the Tigger. That's coming through Ezra, oh, wow. and then mm -hmm. if we go to the next. And it shows you that you can put them on, whoops, you can put them on separate shelves. So that's what I wanted people to see is they can be on separate shelves. And then I know that this camera doesn't quite have the resolution, but understand that your eye is really going to be seeing these little materializing ghosts. It took me two years to create this with my team. And then the other thing I wanted to do was to make sure that they use triple A batteries. Mm -hmm. No weirdo battery that you had to go to the North Shore to find. Right, this, right. This nice little easy put in, easy pop out. That's great. Turn it on, be done. And uh, and they're, they're just really lovely. So they sell in a set. I make it a, a whole experience. So you're not going to get your ghosts in a baggie. There's an entire experience around it. I design boxes, the papers, everything I want to have happen. It gets a certificate of authenticity. It's a big deal. This is my supercalifragilistic project, though. This is more expensive than most of the pieces I do, and it's because it took a lot of work to get here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, I told a lot of people were like, well, is it going to be... Like, you know, is this always the way it is now? They're going to be super expensive. And because I loved collecting the little ones that you right. made. And I said, no, we'll do a super califragilistic one every second or third. So next one we're going to do is a little Cheshire cat. He'll be more reasonable. After that, we're doing figment because I didn't realize what a bad rap poor figment's getting. So we're going to do figment because people are like, figment's getting all in. You know, people get all upset. <laughs> So is it because is it because it's your approach to it and your sculpt that you're allowed to do that or how does that work? I think part of it. Honestly, okay. I think I think there is an unspoken agreement right now. What that means is when they're ready, they'll take it back. You know, that there, there's no, you know, Disney can it's 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 something but it's my interpretation. I've never seen a sculpted version of Phineas in the cape. He's uh -huh. always in the jacket. But everybody wanted the cape because that's closer to the original one where the yeah. second one in Ezra position is a ghost. So I did the cape and I gave him this movement. As you can see, as I spin him around, he's, he's, he's got all kinds of, of energy. So my pieces yeah. have 
a lot of energy it's in not them. stagnant and at I, all. Right. And I don't copy necessarily. So I hear his his legs are different. They're not the same. So when you put them together, they still have the spirit of the ghost, but they <laughs> but they they are still, you know, they're different. You can put them, you know, either way you want, anywhere you want. And they still have this really fun. It's it's in there. It's in there. Look, and it's in their feel. Ezra, are you losing your bottom? Okay, there we go. Let's put that back in. Well, and, well. In, in concluding here, what what do you think? If you were to put it in a few sentences, what do you think it takes to be an Imagineer, and what do you hope to see from future artists and Imagineers going forward? To be an Imagineer, you've got to love collaboration. Okay. My favorite word. You gotta love collaboration. You gotta put that ego back. You also can't be so shy because you're around some greats. Imagineering is the creme de la creme of artists. The best of the best are at Imagineering. So you're gonna see people that you admire and you go, wow, you know, it's him or it's her. You know, they put their pants legs on one at a time. They're, they're good people, they're lovely people, they're friendly and kind people and you're just as good, okay? They've just been around longer. No offense, guys, but it's the truth. And you get sure. in and you collaborate. You do your thing. You, you you're there for a reason. Why did that? Why did Disney choose you? Why are you standing with that hat on? The reason is because you got what it takes. Something they saw in you is what they like. So don't let that inner voice say you're not worthy because you're there and that's what it is. So so you want to have tenacity. You want to be someone who never gives up. You find an alternative if you really mm. believe in it. You fight for it. You understand that uh, you may not get paid what you, you know, go in asking what you're worth and that may be what you make forever. Okay. I don't know, but mm -hmm. I'm just saying, but the perks are fantastic. As a sculptor, I could call anybody anywhere in the world and say I was an Imagineer and I wanted to take a look at this new clay and the truck would back up and dump out a ton just because I was a Disney Imagineer. So that's why I'm saying there's there's other ways of pay that happen. You know, there's sure. other perks of being someone who works with the Disney company. But always remember that with joy of your dream job, you can also possibly be handcuffed. So if you start to feel like you're trapped and it's not the job you believed it was, then what can you do to make it maybe flex a little bit or make it a little bit more what you want or what can you do to um to make it a little more enjoyable because you're collaborating there's always a new thing around the corner to do for sure. right for sure. now it's hard for them they're they got to figure out how to get disneyland open and disneyland's not like all the other parks it's an intimate park we're very close together we don't have the wide streets of the california adventure Shanghai, or even Hong Kong, we are tight, tight, tight. So this yes. is one of the yes. reasons Disneyland has taken so long to open. They got to figure out how we're going to be able to be safe in that park. And then is it worth it for them to open? And that's going to be another mm -hmm. thing. Do they have to, if capacity is so low in order to be safe that it, that it costs more, then that's not going to work either. Right, right. So as an Imagineer, these are all the things you've got to figure out. You know, you got to, I got to get it open, but how do I get it open safely? And I'm really happy to hear that California Adventure is going to do like Knott's Berry Farm along those lines yeah. where they're going to have a walk and eat and, and, and experience out in there because they've got the space to do it. Sure. So yeah. why not? Sure. Yeah. And now they're recalling everybody. They're recalling a lot of the employees back. Mm -hmm. That were furloughed, they're asking a lot of them back because they got an idea. And that's what you do as an Imagineer. You come up with a, you take lemons and you make lemonade. <laughs> Absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> Terry Harden, where can people find you? Oh, Google me. <laughs> but I have a website. It's getting better every day. I'm not a young okay. person. Okay. So the website, terryharden.com, you'll see it, it, it's developing. I'm actually happy to say there's two wheels down instead of just one, and it's getting better every day. I have a Patreon page. It's been scrolling along the bottom. Uh, to be at the base level and be a part of the Patreon page is $5 a month. 
The reason it is, is because I want to over deliver some of the other ones I haven't worked on, but this is because this community is growing and people are having so much fun at that level that the other levels are there and I'll get them to them. But people can come at that level. Many will do a higher level because they're having so much fun at that level. But right, that's yeah. up to you, you know, that's up to you. And then you can just, like I said, Instagram, I'm Terry Arden Legend. You'll see stuff like that. Again, I'm learning about Instagram. So many of you get Terry on TikTok. Me. On TikTok. And pretty soon, yeah, I had an idea finally because I didn't okay. understand how it worked. Mm -hmm. And I thought you had to all do, you see, this is the way you think sometimes. You, right. you you look at two or three of them and they all are the same. And you go, is TikTok people just doing silly dances? That's what I and thought. And then you realize, did you think the same? I, I've been on it for a year and I have over <laughs> half a million followers just doing my jokes and puppets. So, and there's a bunch that? of artists too that have grown their, grown up, I mean, grown a following from TikTok because they're just doing their art. Whether it's painting, sculpting. And so it, it really, you know, you, you assume something. And I was like, well, maybe I could put a joke bit out there. And, you know, I woke up and I had like 10,000 followers and I go, what is this? But it's, you know, it's the times they're growing, they're changing and, and everything is, you know, it's just like what we, what you talked about earlier, where you're like, put your work out there, put what your dream job it is. If you want to be an Imagineer or you want to be an artist and work for something and someone and it's just being seen and, and being heard and, uh, and having that, uh, having that uh, virtual portfolio. So it's fantastic. And if it's not you to be silly, then that's what I'm learning about TikTok. You just go on and you be you within what, 60 seconds or yeah. less? Isn't mm -hmm. that what it is? Yeah. yeah. So to yeah. me, this is fascinating. I said, okay, let me see what I want to do in 60 seconds or less. And then of course, when you speak this out loud, I'll leave you guys with this. You speak this out loud. I said I wanted my social media platform to be bigger and better simply because I can reach more people and I wanted to learn something new. This whole area, this all of this is new to me. I have mm -hmm. to ask people, how do I do this? Um, I have no idea. Walk me through it. So what happened is people saw my, um, my Instagram page and uh, one of the people that saw it was Wired Magazine. And right now they did, they decided to do an article and I love Wired Magazine and, and they found me and they said, would you mind doing something on pumpkins? The answer is, oh yeah. So, you know, right. I, you just do what you love and you talk about why you love it and you start mm -hmm. to say, you know, let me help you get what you want because by doing that, I know I'll be blessed and get what I want. Remember, you're not a goose. You don't have to fly south through the winter, whether you don't or not. You're a human being. You have mm -hmm. the ability to love and you're magical. You can make tomorrow better than today by just making the decision. And that's powerful. That's really powerful. No other creature can do that. So embrace it and realize that's, you know, and if you are someone who goes down the rabbit hole, we all do, feeling melancholy, feeling depressed, feeling sad, that's when you phone a friend or you reach out to your community and tell them, I'm not feeling so great today. So I have a friend, she has a health issues and she's all of a sudden using a walker. She's a very active person. So the fact that she has to use a walker has got her really upset. Mm -hmm. Everybody was, you know, your our prayers, you rest, do this, which is all great, okay? But I wrote to her and said, sometimes you need to lock yourself in the closet and scream. Mm -hmm. And she laughed so hard that she wrote me back and she said, because <laughs> you can imagine as you're scrolling through all the nice comments, our prayers, hang in there, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes you need to lock yourself in the closet and you scream. You put that out there with all the other, oh, that's hilarious. Because I'm a nut. I want you to laugh, just like you yeah. want your jokes. You want people to laugh. So you're looking at it going, well, sure. this is all beautiful. But what's going to get her out of that pity zone? I think I'll just tell her, mm -hmm. find a room and scream. You know, a lot of people, I think being a politician is really a thankless job. I, I admire anyone who wants to be a politician yeah. because unless you're shady, then, you know, you got other motives. But mm -hmm. if you're a good person who wants to help your, your community and you become a politician, 
it's just the th most thankless job. And all I could do is imagine Gavin Newsom, all the people upset at him and angry at him and projecting on him. He's got to have a room where he just jumps in the closet and screams because he's got to be on camera and not say, you idiot, wear a mask. He can't mm -hmm. say it. You know he feels it. We all feel it. He just can't say it because yeah. he's a public official. And this is frustrating, guys. You got to give each other a grain of salt right now during the pandemic because we all don't get to say what we feel. <laughs> and sometimes when we do, it comes back at you. So exactly. you got to be careful, <laughs> you know? Exactly. You don't say something on camera, you're weak. You say something, you're you're this, you know? You just stop worrying about it and 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 be as to do the best you can on there and you know do some TikTok and get a few you know million views and do something you know kind of fun and you know yeah, change I, I I said I'll maybe what I'll do is show my pumpkin I have this pumpkin that I I did for the first time and mm -hmm. I want to do it like uh uh oh what was it called with uh Glenn Close when she uh she plays a woman who is in love with this man, like scary, and she becomes this murderess because she's so twisted over it. Can't remember. And she turns the light on and off. So that's what I want to do with my pumpkin. Figured it'd be a cool TikTok video. Full light, then lit. Full light, then lit. And that's it. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. There you go. And you know what? Is it comes full circle because it all starts with that idea. And that germinates yeah. into something amazing. So yeah. I love it. So I love it so much. I'll probably do that. Because I, I first had to figure out how how you do it. It's like, uh -huh. oh, Instagram story. How do you do an Instagram story? So Wired taught me how to do an Instagram story. So you just keep saying, I, I don't quite understand how this works. Okay, you open the phone, you, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, no one does. And you know what? It, it, take, it takes some experimentation, but you figure it out. Yeah. And then you're like, okay, I, I got the hang of it. So it's, uh, it's exciting. I look forward to seeing... Uh, your TikTok post and uh, Terry Harden, thank you so much for being part of Landon Live and for sharing your story. And thank you for just allowing me to just talk like forever. And uh, oh, we, had a, and, we had a blast. It was it was great. Yeah, we're kindred spirits, you know. Yeah, totally. We were family, like you said, we're kindred spirits. I know you weren't sure about Muppets, but yeah, this is one of the things that frustrates me. Is you yeah. know, don't go out of character. Je treat them gently. There are there are family. Exactly. <laughs> Be careful. Don't yeah. Don't tread on our territory, people. Exactly. Yeah, know, don't know what you're gonna do don't before you. My family, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But you guys take care that that have tuned into this. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this. Make sure to go follow Terry Harden and the links below on this post because it'll be on YouTube and around Facebook. And thank you guys so much. Bye and have a great night. Mm -hmm.